Here we are, Volume 4. This is a historic volume for me, as it was after Volume 4 that I went in to fix the whole show and dedicated myself to helping Ruby find its legs. So, in part, it's thanks to Volume 4 that I'm doing what I'm doing today. It's the first volume to show me in how many ways that Ruby can be actually good. This isn't to say that it didn't have its own problems, mind you, but it's probably one of the best volumes in the entire show, and I hope that with what changes I made, I've only increased the quality it already brings to the table. But let's not waste time reminiscing. A shout out to all the sketchy huntsmen who have been invaluable in aiding me in this volume. I mean, we've increased our ranks to about 30 artists in total, and they've done some incredible work this volume. I am so eager to show you guys the, what they have put in to this project. Uh, a shout out to Fat Man Falling for giving me the writing feedback that I sorely need. Trust me, there was some great back and forth between me and him this volume. And uh, to you, the audience, for keeping me powered throughout all of this. I really couldn't do it without you guys, and I look forward to hearing your reactions to this volume and your feedback, your criticisms. I really am eager to hear them. So, uh, now, without much further ado, Kanpai, everyone! Now, a few house cleaning matters. First things first, we're upping the number of episodes this season from 20 to 22. Why this change? It's a slightly longer story that needs that extra time. I'm pretty sure with the successes of volumes 1 through 3, we could probably leverage a longer development period to make everything work, especially with the switch to Maya. Second is character design. After much deliberation and discussion, I basically made the call that the character designs in volume 4 were only okay. Nothing quite matching the quality of Volume 1 or Volume 2's alternate outfits. So I pitched to the sketchy huntsman for alternate outfits that more or less suit the needs of the story and characters. Here's our brief breakdown of who's wearing what now. First up is our dear Ruby, who has been given a more modest outfit that tries to balance her more naive personality with a growing sense of maturity that we'll begin seeing going forward. Among a number of changes such as a modified cape, newly made ammo corset, double frilled skirt, and detached sleeves, you'll find there is absolutely zero boob windows. Because Ruby bought these clothes, she did not raid them from her sister's wardrobe. John himself has been redesigned from the ground up. He starts this volume by ditching his hoodie and replacing it with a gambeson that he wears underneath his traditional armored plates. Though going forward we'll be swapping those out for new armor because of reasons that we'll see in the first few episodes. We'll touch on that with the full art when we finally reach it. Nora and Ren have been given outfits more indicative of their Mistralian origins, with a clear Asian heritage to most of their design. Ren in particular has a more Wushu-inspired martial arts outfit, while Nora has splicings of Viking fur. Weiss's new outfit will reflect a more practical mindset, as opposed to the dress she wore in the original Volume 4. After suffering the fall of Beacon, she doesn't quite feel comfortable going back to a full civilian garb unless absolutely necessary, so her casual clothing is designed with mobility in mind for emergencies. Blake, meanwhile, has taken an opposite approach. She flees to Menagerie as an escape from a life of combat, and as such has a much more comfortable casual outfit meant for warmer climates. No heavy jacket, and she actually wears a shirt that covers her stomach where she was stabbed. Finally, Yang's outfits in the original were actually pretty good, so much so that her depression outfit, as we've dubbed it inside the Sketchy Huntsman, is completely untouched. Her combat outfit, however, could have used some improvements thanks to the more confusing design ideas like that neck brace thing. 
The new outfit that we have designed for her will only really get featured at the end of the volume, but it features a jacket inspired by the more English and colonial heritage that Vale seems to stem from. And while I do miss the long coat ends, it also makes much more sense if she keeps a shorter jacket for combat. It's more in her style to not have things tangling her up. The rest of the character designs have been left relatively untouched, and some have been left unmentioned because I felt a reveal would probably suit them better. Now, this has probably been the easiest volume to fix since Volume 1, though that doesn't mean I didn't suffer some kind of difficulty in the process. Namely, the nature of hopping back and forth across different periods of time. I've actually sat down and mapped out the story chronologically for each group of characters, so all these events should eventually line up, though if you find a discrepancy of some sort somehow, please let me know and I'll address it in the follow-up video to this series. That goes for all criticisms, comments, and notes. I love hearing from you guys, and sometimes your arguments become the springboard for so many new ideas and angles that I can attack. So please, feel free to leave those down below, I would love to see what you guys think of this. Now, let's get to it! Like with the original volume, we're opening on a grim crawling its way out of a puddle of ooze. But, almost immediately, we're departing from that original scene because this puddle isn't in the land of shadows that Salem lives in. Instead, this puddle is at the base of Beacon Tower, where the Weavern is still leaking black ichor all the way down to the bottom, despite the fact that it itself is still frozen. And yes, like before, these Grimm are unarmored. One crawls out of the ichor and slinks away as the camera comes into focus on the background, where a newly eye-patched Cardin is watching from behind a pillar. Jumping over to him, we get a card overlay telling us it's been one month since the fall of Beacon. Bags frame his eyes, or I guess his eye and eye socket in this case. And his armor has clearly seen better days, with all the scratches and dents on it. He slips back towards the entrance of the tower. As he passes an alcove, a pair of hands shoot out and pull him in, just in time to avoid a pack of Beowulf scrambling past the tower. Cardin pulls the hand off him and glares at none other than Velvet, who is sporting her slightly shorter ear and an equally tired look. They glare at each other, but go stock still as Morgrim pass by. Once they've moved on, Cardin finally asks what Velvet is doing there. She replies that she followed him out of camp after figuring out he's been doing off-the-clock work and pushing himself. She thought he was just being a workaholic, but she didn't realize he was borderline suicidal. She questions what the hell he's doing so close to the tower. Sure, the Grimm are distracted by all the negative emotions on the front lines, but that doesn't mean they're blind. One wrong move, and he'll be eaten alive. Cardin responds that they're getting nowhere with how slow the perimeter is moving. They retake one building, only to lose it the next day. The Weavern keeps spawning whole hordes, so if someone can take it out, the recovery teams can make more progress. Especially since most of the exchange students like Sage and Scarlet have headed home. Velvet slaps him on the arm, growling that full-fledged huntsmen have tried to take that thing down, and they're the ones that are on the front lines making actual progress. Students, let alone freshmen, have barely been able to hold the defensive perimeter. What does he think he's going to do that they can't? Cardin hefts a bag, opening it to reveal what looks to be a cross between red glass and shaped C4 charges. He explains he pulled some family strings to get his hands on enough fire dust to level the tower if he needs to. Velvet remarks, with some trepidation, that he really was going for a suicide mission, to which he rolls his eyes and pulls out a detonator that he says works at a pretty decent range. She shakes her head and asks what happens if all he does is set that thing free. For all they know, keeping that Weavern up there is the best option they have. They don't even know what turned it to stone in the first place. He just looks at her, clearly exhausted more than just physically, and says that he has to try something. Velvet gives him a solid stare before saying that they have to try something. He's not doing this alone. They share a look, and then he nods, accepting her help. Sneaking into the tower, they arrive at the elevator shaft. There, they find a few of the loose cables still dangling, and they use those to ascend, with Cardin in the lead. Time passes as they ascend, slowly, and at one point they have to jump cables because the one they're on can't support their weight anymore, snapping free. Eventually they reach the top, which is still blocked by the mangled mess of an elevator platform that Pira used to ascend during the battle. Seeing a gap between the platform and the shaft, probably left by a previous huntsman who'd come up this way, Cardin moves to slide himself and the bag through, only to be attacked by one of those adolescent Beowulfs. He kicks back as more begin to scrabble at the platform, and the weight begins to push it free from its janky anchoring. One corner of the platform breaks free, and Cardin swings the cord back as the still-wedged platform tilts to a diagonal position. This allows a small horde of Grimm to start pouring through. They plummet, but they all get passing swipes at Cardin and Velvet as they fall, and one of them manages to nick the bag over Cardin's shoulder, tearing the strap and causing it to plummet with them. Cardin curses, and he and Velvet begin to slide down the rope, dodging this way and that to avoid the rain of Grimm coming after them. They eventually get close to the ground floor, but Cardin is tackled by one of the Beowulves. 
Thinking quickly, Velvet springs the wire towards the doorway, causing it to scrape the Grimm off guard and land them both inside the tower's lobby. When they roll to a stop, they pause to catch their breath. Karn slams his hand down onto the ground, cursing his luck. Velvet says that he could still detonate it and take the tower down, but he's quick to say that there's a number of reasons that wouldn't work, but the chief one is that the detonator fell with the bag. They look back at the shaft to see another Beowulf fall past them, giving them a comedic little ARF as it falls by. Figuring that the satchel might as well be buried in Grimm at this point, he elects to just retreat and regroup. Velvet is only happy to agree, and the two scamper out of the tower, making a break across the campus. The camera watches them from above as they leave, and it zooms up the entire length of the tower where behind the Weavern we find a Seer Grimm watching them go, as well as overlooking the distant rescue workers, hunters, and salvage teams that are slowly reclaiming the campus. The camera moves in on the Seer as random snips of Pura's voice grow in volume behind it. The scene goes black. As Pura calls Ruby's name, the darkness opens up with Ruby opening her own eyes. We zoom out to find that she has been shaken awake by Nora. Ruby asks if it's time to go, to which Nora simply responds that Ruby was having a nightmare. Ruby gives a quiet little, oh, and there's a beat of silence before Nora asks if everything is okay. Ruby says that she's fine, but it's clear that neither of them actually believe her and they both know it. Ren and John appear bearing food since the team missed breakfast trying to make sure they weren't late to the train, as this will be the last train to Mistral for the week. Off to the side is a helpful little title informing us that what we're seeing is happening seven months after the fall of Beacon. Nora laments that they didn't get a chance to try out the hotel's waffle iron, which starts a confused comedic conversation between her and John over whether or not she hates waffles or just likes pancakes more. Ruby accepts a sandwich that Ren hands to her, and he comments that the rest of them have noticed that she hasn't gotten much sleep since they arrived in Himawari, the port town that they're currently in. Ruby returns cheekily that she was in a coma for a couple of months. She's already rested plenty. Ren frowns, but willingly allows her to change the subject when she perks and remarks that he and Nora used to live in Mistral. She asks what it's like, and Ren flinches a little bit, but nods, saying that it's been a while since either of them have been out this way. His face twitches when he says that he's disappointed Lionheart couldn't send any airships to pick them up, quickly adding that the Mistralian countryside is particularly beautiful this time of year and trains aren't nearly as scenic. Nora, catching on to the tail end of the conversation from her own with John, remarks, What do you mean? It's plenty scenic from the trains. Heck, we've never even been on an airship out here. Before John or Ruby can ask a follow-up question about Ren's weird comments, they're cut off by screaming coming from down the platform. A pack of Beringals have leaped the defensive wall around the town and are rampaging their way down the track. While the other three have just barely started reacting to the sudden attack, Ruby has already jumped out of her seat and used her semblance to start closing the distance between herself and the ape-like Grimm. What follows is our actual opening fight for the volume between the newly christened Team Ranger and a pack of Beringels, led by an incredibly violent and powerful Alpha. Like last season, I'm not going to dwell too much on the choreography of fights that I have to invent myself, mostly because it saves time, but also because, unlike most other aspects of writing, this is one area where working with what the animators can accomplish is the most limiting. So instead, I'll give the broad strokes and intent behind the scene, and you can feel free to fill in the details as you see fit. So over the course of this fight, Ruby overexerts herself in trying to protect all of her friends simultaneously, exhausting herself quickly by overusing her semblance. This, combined with a harebrained scheme involving a tanker truck laden with gravity dust, ends with the Alpha Bearing Gel, the train's engine, and the tracks going up in a giant anti-gravity fireball, ending the fight. The tracks in particular are damaged, as feedback from the gravity dust overloaded the tracks going out a mile out of the town, causing the rails to literally explode from overpressure. Notably, during this fight, John's sword is broken, his shield is damaged, and his pack is torn open, letting Pyrrha's old broken sword and shield clatter to the ground. One last notable instance during this fight is when Nora is cornered. She reaches into her pouch for something that we can't see, but decides better of it when Ren swings around to save her. Once the battle is concluded, Ren watches the Alpha's remains disintegrate, leaving behind a heavy collection of bones. He surmises that this was an old Grimm that had been biding its time to gather a pack and attack the town mostly because Beringals are more prone to ambush hunting than frontline assaults. The train's conductor examines the damage and confirms that nothing is getting in or out of the station anytime soon. They suggest trying to load trains from outside the walls where the tracks are still intact, but the conductor shakes that idea off, as the amount of people they need to keep track of would make it too dangerous to organize and keep safe from the Grimm. They're a port town, but not a very populated one. Even with four experienced huntsmen in training and five on-duty huntsmen, there'd be a significant risk to the civilians that go out that far. 
Ruby apologizes for the damage, and the man laughs, explaining that, This is what insurance is for, kiddo! He says that if they're planning on continuing to Mistral, it'd probably be best to find a way to Xion, which is the next closest station. It's a little far, but they can shelter up in the town of Subaki along the way. If they don't get eaten by Grimm, they could make the journey in just two or three days to catch the train coming from Mistral. He then excuses himself to go radio Mistral about the situation. The group discuss the options and ultimately agree to go to Xion, though they're not happy about it since being in two different towns will start to drain on their pooled money reserves, let alone the cost for light camping equipment like sleeping bags. John also feels suitably disarmed with the destruction of his sword and shield, though Ruby assures him that they can find a way to repair them when they get to Tsubaki or Xion. She even reassures him about paying for it, since they can probably find a job while they're out at Tsubaki and they have a few days to buffer before the train gets to Xion. John nods in agreement, getting a little more pep in his step. As he walks away, Ruby looks back towards the carnage of the train yard and frowns. She looks down at Crescent Rose, closes her eyes, and takes a deep breath before putting it away and walking off with her friends. And with that done, we hit this season's intro. We open episode 2 eight months after the fall of Beacon. We find Wei silently walking through her home like she did in the original episode 2, and on reflection, those shots were really great at establishing how lonely Weiss felt before attending Beacon. She arrives at a door where Klein is waiting. He opens it and announces her presence. She emerges into a gala, where she moves to politely greet her guests and play the good hostess. The guests' voices begin to blur together, as do their appearances, melting away into nothing but colorful silhouettes to further emphasize that, even in a crowded room, Weiss is alone. This is only broken when Whitley is announced, standing out as the only unique figure amongst the crowd. Whitley approaches Weiss and shares a few polite words with the guests that she's chatting with. The guests move on, and Weiss, keeping her strained smile, questions if Whitley has grown since he seems taller. Whitley is a little smug and affirms that he's been the same height for months and suggests that she keep her eyes checked, adding that Winter saw the change immediately. Weiss is confused, asking, Since when has Winter's opinion mattered to you? Before he can respond, Jacques appears at the top of the stairs to the gala and conducts a speech, thanking everyone for being in attendance, especially at Legion Roundtable members Camilla and Sleet. He makes a brief jab at General Ironwood and member Chartouze for not attending, a backhanded compliment of sorts, but is quick to move on to the goal of the gala, promoting unity in trying times. His speech fades into the background as we see Weiss and Whitley watching him. Weiss comments that Jock doesn't even need them there for this, it's just more grandstanding for himself after all. Whitley supposes that it's to show family unity, but chucks that idea out the window himself, commenting that if Jock really wanted to do that, he'd have dragged their mother away from her wine glasses and flower beds. He theorizes that maybe Jock was hoping Weiss would sing for the crowd. He looks to her and asks if she would once Jock's speech is over. She huffs and turns away, saying that if he was going to act as Jock's messenger boy, he should have worn a uniform. Whitley feigns being wounded and asks when Weiss gained such an acerbic wit. He doesn't let her respond, instead insisting that she spent so much time cooped up in her room that he simply wanted to hear his sister's wonderful voice. Weiss appraises him briefly before commenting, You? seem different. And he responds, Spend some time outside of your room, and I think you'll find more has changed than you think. After this, he walks away, leaving Weiss alone in the ocean of people. We cut to the actual ocean with Blake, traveling by boat to Menagerie only one month after the fall of Beacon. We get Blake's conversation with the ship's captain, where he basically tries to defuse the walking ball of angst as a precaution against Grimm. After he goes away, instead of letting go of her ribbon, she catches wind of a man in a cloak stalking her from a distance. She corners the man in a short, somewhat comedic pursuit scene where she loses the man's tail only to turn it around on him. After holding a blade to his throat, the man is revealed to be Sun, who has been tailing Blake in the weeks following Beacon's collapse, including stowing away on the ship. Blake takes a sniff of the air and cringes, saying that it explains a lot. Instead of launching into a prolonged fight sequence, we're treated to a heart-to-heart -heart between the two, where Blake gets to unload a bit of her pathos on the Sun. She first starts out scolding him for following her, but he defends this by pointing out that she was brutally injured, and since she's so stubborn, she could have easily gone off to fight the White Fang on her own by hitching a ride to Menagerie. She rejects his assumption that she's going to Menagerie to fight the White Fang. In fact, contrary to popular belief, the White Fang's central organization is in Mistral. Instead, she's just… running. Sun asks what happened with Yang, as he only ever saw the aftermath. Blake chokes out Adam's name, but swallows down the rest of her words to prevent herself from crying. Sun is quick to assure that she doesn't need to tell him and that she can take her time, and she's grateful for this. She composes herself and explains that her old partner in the White Fang almost killed her and Yang, but most details she leaves vague. 
She explains that every single time she looks at Yang's stump while they were there in the hospital, she felt nothing but guilt, an unbearable crippling amount. Unable to stand it, she ran. Just ran away, booked a trip, and followed through. Even now, she's twisted with even more guilt over abandoning her friend, paralyzing herself between facing her guilt head-on or avoiding it and hoping she never has to. Sun very carefully asks what Blake is planning to do once she gets to Menagerie, to which she responds that she doesn't know. But she knows one thing, she's sick of hiding who she is. And with that, she removes her bow and tosses it into the water. She muses that it's at least one weight off her shoulder. Sun agrees and muses that it's what Blake needs to do, remove the weights one by one, vowing to help her do it every step of the way. He wraps that saying that he's never been to Menagerie before, so he's excited, giving a his journey to the east pun before we close on the scene. We skip back, er, forward, to eight months after Beacon's fall, where Yang is depressed and watching TV. The news updates discuss difficulties with repairing Vale's CCT since Atlas's dust embargo went into effect and communication with their engineering firms have been slow. On a different channel, we get reports that Huntsmen have made significant progress in reclaiming Beacon's campus as the Older Grim have largely been dealt with, though officials say it'll still be some time before it can be restored and reopened. Switching to one more channel, there's a discussion panel on the role the White Fang played in the attack at Beacon and how the now-in-custody former leader still insists that it was a rogue element responsible for the attack. Adam isn't mentioned by name, but a blurry image of him appears alongside a collection of White Fang troops, prompting Yang to turn off the TV. The rest of the scene is largely untouched, as Tai arrives to the front door carrying a whole host of packages. He presents Yang with her new arm, one of the few items to make it of Atlas because it was sent by Ironwood as part of a program honoring all the students injured and protecting civilians during the fall. It's not the highest end model, like the original show insisted, but a higher end model. I know that's basically potatoes potatoes, but it irks me that the last time that Ironwood interacted with her, she had inverted some kids' kneecaps during the tournament. So. Why she got special treatment kind of baffles me. Here, it's part of a larger program, and it's not so advanced, so it's not super special awesome, just respecting her for the effort she put in in standing her ground like she did, and rewarding her for that determination. Anyway, Ty suggests that if she wants to get used to her arm, he could squeeze her in with his rehab classes, mentioning Neptune would probably be happy to have a friend along for the last stretch. Yang responds as apathetically as she did to the original and retreats to her bedroom. We cut to the montage of her doing her chores, and this is untouched save for the PTSD episode where she drops her glass. Now I'm not changing the trigger or the effect, those are perfectly fine as I've now learned researching PTSD a little more. Instead, what I'm changing is Tai's role in the scene, as when Yang snaps out of her Adam hallucination, Tai is standing in front of her where Adam had been. He's looking at her with concern and leaning forward, unsure of how to help her. With her faculties returned, she whispers, Damn it! and slams her hand down on the counter ending the episode. Episode 3 opens with a child's voice counting down from 10 for hide-and-seek tag. When he opens his eyes, we see he's a boy of about 9 or 10 with orange blonde hair and striking green eyes. He begins looking for his friend Aventine, who he calls Avi, and when he catches her, she runs, giggling all the way. The two run through a farm before passing a well, and a sound from within the well makes the boy stop. He stares at it, and we learn that his name is Remus when Avi calls after him, confused why he stopped chasing her. He shakes off the weird feeling he has towards the well and resumes chasing her, playing off his paws as a trick to get her to slow down. They run off, but the camera lingers on the well and the slowly increasing bass overtaking the soundscape. When it reaches its crescendo, the screen goes black and we cut to our opening credits. Returning from the opener, we get the original events of Volume 4 Episode 1, The Next Step, almost completely untouched. Added are a few lines of concern from John near the beginning of the scene, worrying about Ruby going off on her own to scout out their target. Ren responds that Ruby knows how to handle herself, though John expresses doubt just before Ruby emerges from the tree line being chased by the Geist. Now, there's a number of issues with this fight that need to be fixed in choreography I'm not going to touch, but the changes that need to be made thematically are notable. For one, it's still John who takes command during the fight, suggesting they deal him the Geist's body to get it to expose itself. Additionally, no one has upgraded their weapons yet, meaning Nora isn't using her weapons to get a jolt. Instead, she slams a small amount of electric dust into her body from her satchel, something that concerns Ren and physically pains her despite the fact that it gives them an edge over what is slowly becoming a difficult battle. All the same, Ruby and Nora still defeat the Grimm using a tag team maneuver and finish it off with a well-placed sniper round that we actually get to see connect in a pretty cool camera through the bullet wound camera shot. We jump back to the village where Ruby and the crew are being rewarded for taking out the Geist, and there's an offhand mention of the two local huntsmen they have on hand. 
The guys had managed to put them out of commission, thus leading to discussions of whether to relocate the village or get outside help like Team Ranger. After the relatively untouched pleasantries, we move on to the blacksmith where John's sword and shield have been repaired using steel from Pyrrha's own sword and shield. The man even throws in a collapsible helm for John since he had enough material left over between the two weapon sets and decided to get creative with it. Now with John's new outfit set up, we don't get that weird pumpkin peat scene where Ruby's head inflates to fill the room. Instead, we get a moment of John looking forlornly at the weapon and mumbling about not deserving it. Ren reassures him that Pyrrha would probably have preferred her weapons still get used, and in that way John is keeping her alive. John sighs and turns to Ruby, asking her to remind him to thank her uncle for recovering Pyrrha's effects for them along with their spare gear. We get their little departure talk outside of the blacksmiths and the dispute over who's in charge of the map, and the wide shot that pulls up to the sky as their argument fades out, ending episode 3. Episode 4 opens quite literally with a set of double doors, one month after the fall of Beacon. Adam strolls through the doors to a throne room that has obviously seen better days, with White Fang soldiers picking up pieces of debris, mopping up stray specks of blood, and posting White Fang banners across the walls. In the middle of this room is Sienna Khan, with her back to Adam observing the work being done by her subordinates. Without him saying a word, she begins to appraise the building out loud, commenting how it was owned by a black market slave trader and it had only just been liberated in the name of the cause. She muses how ironic it is that a place once so foul would become the perfect staging ground for a new era of the White Fang. Adam asks where Onryo is, referring to Kin Onryo who led the White Fang after Gira. Sienna turns to him and snarls that Onryo has been deposed and arrested for the atrocities committed in Vale. It was all she could do to save the White Fang from international retribution on an unprecedented scale, and now their reputation has to be completely rejuvenated from the ground up. She finally turns to look at Adam, insisting that he should be arrested for his role in things too. She demands to see the lieutenant since she's been locked out of Unryu's files and she wants to hear what his orders were directly from him. Adam, quickly sensing the gravity of his position, lies, saying the lieutenant was killed during the attack at Beacon and there was no time to collect his things. He tells a sliver of truth, that there was a deal made with humans that the lieutenant found beneficial to their aims, but it ultimately backfired when he was stabbed in the back in the field. Adam barely had time to retreat with the few troops that had been captured or killed. Sienna narrows her eyes at Adam and wonders aloud how strange it was for the lieutenant to make such a decision. He was always more of a follower than a leader and his relationship with Adam and Blake was always close. He'd always defer to Adam's command if it ever came to it. Adam shrugs the veiled accusation off, saying that having a command of his own in Vale gave the lieutenant a much needed backbone, even if it ended up costing him his life. Sienna continues to scrutinize Adam before brushing the subject aside telling him he's been demoted immediately for going along with such an abhorrent plan and he's lucky he's popular enough among the troops, else she'd have him arrested alongside Onryu. Adam grits his teeth and bends to the demotion, though visibly stiff over it. As he's leaving, she tells him to be careful to not make messes he can't clean up. Outside the throne room is Ilya leaning against a wall, waiting to mock Adam upon his exit. She jibes at his demotion and wonders aloud how Blake will react, seeing him hang his head like a slapped puppy. Adam actually growls at this, but she persists, wondering where Blake is actually since she hasn't replied to any of Ilya's messages in a couple of months. Adam's grimace turns into a cruel smile as he tells Ilya that Blake has defected and actually sided with the humans during the Battle of Beacon. Ilya laughs it off as a joke, but when Adam continues just staring at her, her laughter dies down and shock begins to grow in her face. She begins to stutter that he's lying to her, because Blake would never join them, she hates them just as much as they did, that Blake would never leave them behind. Adam just turns around and keeps walking away, chuckling bitterly that he thought the same thing, ending the scene. We jump to Kuokuana and Menagerie where Blake and Sun have arrived by boat and are exiting into the market square. Sun remarks how few people there seem to be. He expected the place to be absolutely packed from what livable land there is to work with. Blake explains that it's the hot season so most people are going to be spending their time in the shade and not out and about unless they need something specific. Sun comments the heat isn't that bad, which is true for a man that grew up in the desert, in fact, for him, this weather is perfectly pleasant. Blake agrees that it's pretty nice this time of year, but monsoon season can get nasty and there's not much people can do other than hunker down and hope their homes don't get swept away. She bitterly remarks that Menagerie is just one step away from a tropical paradise, kept at bay by bad weather in the spring and an inhospitable wasteland beyond the walls. They arrive at a hill overlooking most of the city, which is comprised of interconnected slum-like housing and occasionally broken up by larger, wealthier, more private homes. Blake, seeing her house, remarks that her parents must have added that expansion they wanted as it looks bigger than she remembers. At least, she still hopes it's her home. It's been years since she's seen her family. Sun asks which house she's referring to and she points him to the, arguably the biggest house on the entire city. Sun just stares agape at her, asking, wait, what? 
before she drags him off to the front door. When they go to the door, warm reunions ensue as they did before, and we swap over to tea time with the Belladonnas. This is basically the same scene, just with a few more details tacked on. For example, Callie explains that she was relieved to see Blake fighting for Beacon in the tournament, the first time that she'd seen her daughter in years, and she was alive and well, but she was equally as scared when the Fee died in the middle of the battle. They've only gotten scattered reports about what happened since the Tower and Veil vale went down, and none of it sounds particularly good. The rest of the conversation proceeds as normal. Then Fennec and Corsic arrive, and their conversation varies in only two places. When it's mentioned Gira as the new chieftain of Menagerie, and when they offer their explanation for the events at Beacon. With the former, Blake reacts with shock, and Gira explains that it was a very recent appointment overshadowed by hype over the Vital Festival tournament outside of Menagerie. With regards to the latter, Fennec and Corsic explain that the Vale Branch were operating as a rogue faction with tacit permission from Kin on Ryu. Now that he's in jail and the Vale Branch is under the firm control of Sienna Khan, the brothers came seeking Gira's help in rehabilitating the name of the White Fang before long-lasting damage can be done. When Blake objects, detailing what the Fang did while in Vale, the brothers are obviously apologetic and offer to present what official documents they have on the matter to Gira for consideration at the next major government meeting. Gira, skeptic, says that he'll entertain their evidence, but if they're looking for an endorsement, they better have something to impress him. They give their parting remarks to Blake, take jibes that she stopped fighting, Blake gets indignant that she hasn't stopped fighting, and they give an open invitation for her to return, sans Ilya remark. Then they leave. Sun gives his frank appraisement of them, Gira gives his frank appraisement of Sun, and the episode ends with the door closing on the camera. Episode 5 opens in the Yang's Nightmare of Adam, and flows smoothly through her talk with Tai, Port, and Ublek. Honestly, this scene is one of the best in the series as it handles a delicate subject matter realistically and depicts the kind of kick in the ass Yang needs in order to get out of her depression and back into the world. We only need small tweaks, like having Port mention the slow but inevitable reclamation of Beacon moving at a steady pace, and more than half of the grounds have been recovered and secured under Glinda's round-the-clock leadership, much of which has been done in the last month alone. There's also a passing mention of Coffee asking Yang about her well-being and sending their well wishes to her. But other than those small ads, this scene carries on just like before. We swap over the Ranger in good spirits as they're traveling along a cliffside, on the other side of which is Xi'an where they're eager to spend the night in the comfort of an inn before the train from Mistral arrives. We get the stray comments about John's family visits to Xi'an since it's a popular spa town, as well as the anecdotes about the shenanigans involving his sisters. They stop when they round the cliff and see smoke drifting on the wind. They all rush forward and find Xi'an burning to the ground with bodies scattered this way and that. When they find the dying huntsman, he explains that a horde of Grimm tried to break through the eastern wall, and while the guards and huntsmen were distracted with that, bandits swept in from the west and raided the whole town. In the chaos, the Grimm finally broke through, leading to the whole town being slaughtered. John orders Nora to start getting out their first aid supplies. Ruby looks at the man's wounds and then to John, suggesting they carry him to the train station, hole up there and wait for the train from Mistral to get them out of there. Unfortunately, the man rejects the idea, as Mistral was notified about the attack and the train's not coming. In fact, in light of the attack at Xi'an and Himawari, train services have been temporarily suspended until the tracks and their connecting towns can be fully reinforced. The last train has already been turned around and pointed back at Mistral. John chokes back a curse and turns to Ruby, fumbling for the map and suggesting they patch the Huntsman up and set up for Higimbana. It's about a two weeks walk, but if they ration their resources, they can make it in time. Just as Nora is handing John some gauze and bandages, Ren stops and emotions to the Huntsman, who has stopped moving completely. The four grit their teeth over the loss and Ruby closes the man's eyes. Nora asks if they should bury him, but Ren suggests just leaving, which makes everyone uncomfortable even if they end up agreeing. Nora follows after Ren, concerned, and while Ruby tries to assure John that things will be okay, it's clear they're both stressed out over what they're seeing, especially because they both remark Mistral closing its train lines down altogether doesn't make a lot of sense to them. This is when Ren and Nora, while exiting the village, spot the hoof print in the mud and share knowing glances to each other. The last part of the episode is Yang emerging from her front door with the arm on, and Tai saying, it's time to begin. We open the next episode on Blake's conversation with Callie, where she's encouraged to talk with her father. Once done imparting her advice, Callie goes off to make babies with Sun or whatever she was doing in that scene, and Blake heads inside to talk with her dad. She goes in, and the same awkward conversation ensues, Sans comments about the stomach armor because our new character design has, at least to some degree, mitigated what would prompt that comment. Again, Gira is incredibly understanding about Blake's concerns towards her parents when she lists, in broad strokes, all the horrible things she did while running away with the White Fang. Even when she breaks down about falling down the wrong path, he props her back up by mentioning how she found her way out, how she did the right thing in the end time after time, at least if what her and son have told him is true. 
Now, instead of getting interrupted by Sun, we actually get to dive into when Blake is asked why she left Beacon, and Blake recoils at the question. She admits that she was just scared. She was scared and panicked, and the only thing that made sense was to go home, the last place she thought she might feel safe. There's more, she admits, but that's why she chose Menagerie. The rest, she reserves to tell him later, not quite ready to talk about it with someone who wasn't at the fall. He understands, and he offers his daughter a hug, receiving one in return. When they pull away, he asks if she has thought about what she'll be doing while she's in town. He's more than willing to lend her and her friend a roof to stay under, but he suggests that getting some kind of work might help her work through things. Blake sits quietly for a moment, reflecting on her lack of professional training or experience, since she didn't exactly get to finish her schooling. Gira suggests the Kuokuana City Guard, since it'll employ most of the things she's learned about while not being quite full-time huntress work. When she looks at him, skeptical about the idea, he says that he'll pull some strings with some friends in the forest to keep her off the wall. She won't have to see a grim as long as he has anything to say about it. Blake hesitates for one more minute and goes to agree only for Sun to knock down the door and ruin the moment. Unlike in the original, we're cutting before Gira can really make any comments because they tried to turn I really don't like you into a running gag and I thought that it was a little too much comedy for this particular scene. Following this, we cut to the argument between Ironwood and Jock. Again, this is a decent scene, and the content only needs a bit of a touch-up to match the revised prior events and events to come. With Ironwood being frustrated about Jock's outspoken resistance to the dust embargo, clarifying the level of public disapproval there is towards it, and changing the council to the Atlesian Roundtable like before. The major changes come when Ironwood offers Wise a position in Atlas. He tacks on that Winter speaks very highly of her sister before leaving, and that comes into play almost immediately when Wise politely but firmly refuses Jock's request that she sing at the next gala he's hosting. Jock mulls over her rejection before he slaps an offer right back in her face saying that he may just be able to arrange some time off for her sister to spend time at home, where she'd be welcomed back with open arms for a temporary amount of time. He's pretty sure that the General would be willing to trade anything for Jock's silence on the embargo for a month, and a week of shore leave for winter would certainly be on the table. She deserves it, of course, after all the hard work she's done in Mistral. Reading Weiss like a book, he shrugs, saying singing a song or two might be a small price to pay to see her sister for a little while while unimpeded. Weiss bites her lip over the request and frowns. After a few seconds, she composes herself and asks if her dad really wants her to sing that badly, and he says that he does. Sighing, and drawing her face into a leer, she says, Fine. I get to see Winter, and I'll sing. But I'm choosing the music. He waves her off, saying as long as it's agreeable to the audience, he doesn't quite care. It's all to please the crowd, after all. She leaves as she has the cute little scene with Klein outside, and we cut away. In and out, Morty! 20 minute fix and we're done! In a Mistralian bar, we find Sienna calmly sipping on a mug of ale. Adam walks into the room, and she waves him over. He goes over to her table and quietly stares at her, giving the bar a once-over. She assures him that this bar in particular is a friend of the Fang. Adam, still wary, sits across from Sienna and accepts the mug she passes to him. He asks why she asked him out there. She made it pretty clear she was furious with him. She sighs, pushing her mug to the side. She admits that she was harsh on him, but asks if he understands why she was so harsh. The attack at Beacon left what little goodwill the White Fang had in Vale at an all-time low. She adored Onryu and his leadership, and she respected his decisions, but the attack was too much too quickly. Sure, the White Fang wants to bring the Fauna Suppression to the forefront, but going all in on the violence angle puts the White Fang in the crosshairs of the kingdoms and law enforcement. Before, they were skirting the edges of just being noticeable enough, but now there's an active headhunt for any members of Vale's White Fang faction. Denouncing their actions was the only way to save the rest of the organization from similar levels of persecution. Adam growls that she made them the scapegoats, but she emphatically defends that the decision that she made was the only one that could be made in order to save the Fang. She points to Adam and says that his cell put the entire organization in a spot that they couldn't just wiggle out of. Things would have been fine if they stuck to their robberies and civil disobedience like they were instructed. This is one of the reasons why she demoted him. She knows how passionate he is, but she can't just have him running off on his own anymore, especially because she suspects that he was much more involved in the Veil vale plot than he admits. She's been busy getting parts moving around the globe, in tandem with her PR control efforts. Protests in Veil, vale, recruitment drives in Vacuo, political advocacy in Menagerie. Heck, she's gotten some of the top hunters in Mistral into her pocket, and she even found someone in Atlas with political aspirations. Overall, she set the White Fang on the track for a globe-spanning shift within the next decade. Adam tightens his grip on his mug, breaking it. 
he hisses that it's too slow, that they were making much faster progress before. Sienna just calmly points out, slow and steady wins the race. This isn't a war. You can fight a kingdom, maybe two, but you can't fight the whole world without a plan and expect to win. Adam says nothing and stands. Sienna says that she values him, but he needs to keep his temper in check and realize when slowing down is the best option. He says that, with all due respect, he prefers not to be the one doing catch up when they're already so far behind. Sienna just frowns at him as he walks into the night, ending the episode. Episode 7 begins with Ruby waking up to Pyrrha's voice. Like in the original volume, she finds John practicing. She watches for a time, letting Pyrrha give her words of admiration and encouragement, and in a cutaway we see Nora in her sleeping bag, listening, barely able to hear the voice in the distance. Awake and seemingly upset at hearing Pyrrha's voice, Nora curls in on herself and takes a deep breath, closing her eyes to force herself back to sleep. Back with Ruby, she begins to tear up hearing Pyrrha's voice again, and with this, she accidentally outs herself to Jean. He looks over at her and leaves the recording running as he approaches her. They share teary-eyed looks, unable to say anything to each other. He laughs off the recording, saying it's old stuff he's already familiar with, but the new sword has a different weight to it, and he just wanted to hear Pyrrha's voice again. Ruby responds weakly that it's like she's still with them that way, and John nods, affirming that he believes that she still is. He was never the most religious person, but he says that he can feel it, that she's still watching over them. Ruby laughs that Pyrrha always did have John's back and wipes away some of her tears. As she says this, we're treated to brief clips of Pyrrha and John together while Ruby was present, and Ruby's eyes actually flicker for a moment. Caught off guard, Ruby is stunned, and John asks what just happened. Ruby, unable to answer herself, begins to breathe a little harder, saying she doesn't know. John curses about how much they don't know, that there's so little they can prepare for. He just wants to find the people that did this, all of this, and make them pay for what they did, and end the mess entirely. Ruby assures them that they'll figure things out. Times are tough, they're confused, but as long as they have each other, they'll make it through. When the conversation fails to continue, she ends it herself, suggesting that she get back to bed. John looks back at the recording that's still playing and says it's probably a good idea. He sees Ruby off, and then drops back into position as Pyrrha begins to tell him to strike, again and again, and again. As John's blade comes down, we transition into the middle of the cut with Adam, who's practicing with his blade in what appears to be a retrofitted practice hall in the Concord Villa. We hear whispers of Blake's voice, almost too quiet to perceive, that spur Adam into more violent strikes. After exhausting himself, Ilya appears behind him and makes herself known by commenting how ragged he looks. He sheathes his sword and says that he's run that way by his new quote-unquote superior. If he had to guess, Sienna had them under orders to work him hard, so he quit the White Fang voluntarily. He smirks, saying, As if I'd give her the satisfaction. I want the humans to pay more than I am miserable. Ilya is quiet, not really commenting for or against the statement. Instead, she finally asks why Blake left. Adam pauses in the middle of cleaning up equipment around the room. Finally getting his bearings, he says matter-of-factly that Blake was weak-willed. Unspoken, they both saw where the White Fang was headed, what needed to be done, but when the time came, only he had the will to pull the trigger. In many ways, he relates it to Sienna's paradigm shift for the group. Aggressive protests, limited, quiet assassinations, and propaganda campaigns. All of it is garbage if no one listens. Under Onryo, they've been making progress, but with Sienna, they're taking steps back. Blake? Blake is worse, he says. She didn't just start advocating peace for humans, but started working with them. She had her head so filled with lies that she's just another puppet on the string for the humans to parade around, just like her father before her. He thought her turning her back on her family meant that she was immune, but he thought wrong, and he blames himself for not protecting her better from the filth. He actually chokes a little bit at that, whispering again to himself that it's his fault before becoming composed. Ilya folds in on herself, still in a modicum of shock over hearing Blake's defection. She voices that after everything Ilya had warned her about, about how cruel humans could be after Ilya told her about her parents, Blake would understand that peace with humans needed to be fought for, not negotiated. Adam expresses relief to be in the room with someone that understands. He admits that they never really saw eye to eye on things, but knowing he's not alone is some comfort. Ilya laughs that maybe it's because they're so similar. Like personalities can be like the polar ends of a magnet and repel each other. Maybe they understand each other a little too well. Adam reflects on those words and asks how the response has been to Sienna's coup. Ilya gives a mixed response, saying that there's more than enough that want to follow the less overt direction Sienna has charted them for, but there's a growing number that still believe Onryo was leading them down a more successful avenue. Adam nods and says that in time, the White Fang will need to reassert itself on the world stage if they're ever to make any kind of progress, and he hopes that Ilya is there alongside him to see it through. They both pause. Adam expecting her to say something, and Ilya simply hesitates to respond. And then quietly, 
Adam walks out of the room without hearing if she decides to respond at all. Focusing on his feet walking, we transition to Blake, doing her rounds while dressed in that snazzy guard armor that we got a good look at in Volume 5. Accompanying her is that Cat Faunus guard that everyone fell in love with. They end up at the town guard's headquarters, and the other guard bids Blake farewell as she heads into the lockers while Blake goes to give the report to the superior. She's called in by Saber Rodentia, a character I didn't even remember from Volume 5, let alone knew had a name, who apparently is this guy who is the captain of the guard. Blake gives a basic report where the only thing of note was them stopping a pickpocket kid who had decided to let go with a warning. Saber is amused by this, but doesn't quite look up from his notes. Instead, he asks Blake how long she's been in the guard now. A month? A month and a half? Establishing that a bit of time has passed since we last saw her. Blake confirms it'll be two months next week, and he nods at that. He asks how she's liking it, and she responds that it feels nice to help people, even if the work is a little dry. It's... peaceful. He chuckles, since the more exciting work is along the wall. He continues that Blake is exemplary at the job, especially compared to that friend who joined with her, who has been too lackadaisical for Saber's taste. But he also notes that the reports that he's read have mentioned how reclusive Blake is. She helps out, she does her duty, but she never quite seems all there when on duty. So he asks again, is she happy being in the guard? Blake raises a brow and asks who's really asking. Saber or her dad? He levels a stare at her, crossing his arms, asking if it's really that hard to believe he's genuinely concerned over his subordinate. She perks a brow and immediately points to his snide remark towards Sun not a minute earlier, to which he defends that the boy thinks he's being endearing with his shenanigans, but Saber largely agrees with Gira on him being an irritation. Before their conversation can continue, the cat guard comes bursting through the door, half-armored, panting. She quickly tells about a breach in the southern wall not too far from where the guard post is. The town guard managed to seal it, but a Deathstalker managed to break through and they're having problems taking it out. Saber attaches his sword to his belt and tells the cat to get her armor back on. He spares a glance to Blake, who is frozen on the spot, but ultimately decides to go on wordlessly without her. Blake, however, grabs his hand and holds him in place even though she's trembling. She explains that she's dealt with Deathstalkers before, insisting that she can handle this. She cuts Saber off from asking questions, insisting again that she can do this. He finally nods and motions for her to follow. They rush out to the streets, and we cut to when they arrive at a roadway where the other guards are trying to contain the scorpion like one would a wild bull. That is to say, they're doing it poorly. Now again, going broad strokes on the details of the fight here, we have Saber getting knocked out of commission, the other guards being basically ineffective at slowing the thing down, and Blake being left to 1v1 the Deathstalker. At some point, her helmet is knocked off, and near the latter half of the fight, she uses her semblance to trick the Grimm into stabbing an electrical cable box, giving it a hearty shock. With the tail locked in place, she uses the ribbon on Gamble Shroud to sever the Deathstalker's stinger, which leaves it stumbling. With it wounded, she sneaks into its blind spot and severs both of its claws in sequence before cutting its legs out from under it. With the creature basically undesiplegic, Blake calmly walks up to its still-living head and impales it on a wide section of Gamble Shroud. She pulls her blade free just as several civilians begin snapping pictures and cheering for her heroics. A second later, Sun arrives, breathing heavily that he came to help Blake before petering off when he realizes the Deathstalker is already dead. She turns just to smile at Sun, a full-toothed, genuine smile that is observed by Saber from afar. He shakes his head and laughs as the screen goes black, stating, So that's how it is, as the episode ends. Episode 8 opens with Yang and Neptune sitting out an outdoor bench of a clinic, with Yang removing her arm and putting it away after what looks like a hefty workout. The two are talking casually about different motorcycles and other such shop talk, with Yang getting defensive when Neptune says that her bike is quickly going out of date. She says he better be careful with its words or she'll put him out of date, to which he turns around and asks for a date instead. Yang rolls her eyes and pushes Neptune away with a laugh, telling Casanova to tell it to someone that doesn't know he still needs floaties when going into a pool. Neptune curses to himself when he agreed to try swimming therapy. Yang just smiles and says, I mean, it helped, didn't it? Neptune gets up on a pair of crutches, looks at them, and agrees. He says goodbye and departs, and that's when Tai walks in, having watched the conversation. He comments how happy she looks and how well it seems to be going along now that she's been getting therapy going. And she responds that, yeah, things do feel better. Almost normal. Almost. She looks down at her stump with that. Ty sits down next to her and rests a hand on her shoulder, saying that he's proud of her for just making it this far. She's resilient, and he knows that she can make it through anything. It's one of the best traits she seemed to have inherited from her mother. 
Yang's face kind of scrunches up before she breathes out and says, So, now we can talk about her? Tai hesitates but nods and shoots back he has been informed she's an adult now, a nod back to the earlier scene with Port Nublek. He continues, noting that both of them take a problem head-on and tackle it full force in order to solve it. All it takes for them is to get pointed in the right direction and they just bowl the problem over. But he doesn't want her to be so much like her mother. Running headfirst into a wall isn't always the best option and Raven struggled with it. Like, settling down. Her nature of just beelining for the simplest solution ended up hurting all of Strike, hurting the whole family. Yang mumbles out that Raven didn't want a kid, but Tai shakes his head that it wasn't the case. She loved Yang, but she also loved her tribe. Tai fought to keep Yang, and ultimately, he won out, with Raven leaving them both behind. Yang pauses before her voice rises in surprise that Raven wanted her. That Tai kept her from Raven. Tai is quick to shoot down Yang's phrasing. With him, she had somewhat of a normal life, and he wanted that for Raven too. She rejected him at every turn, and if he let Raven take Yang, she'd be out there today pillaging hapless towns. Yang is quick to argue that Tai could have gone with Raven, only for Tai to turn around and ask if he should have become a bandit, if he should have raised her around thugs and criminals. He loved her mother, and he learned to look beyond her past, but he was hoping to drag her out of that mess, not get dragged into it himself, much less get his own flesh and blood involved. Yang is trembling now, unable to process the information as she says it wasn't his choice to make, to which he snaps, like hell it wasn't, I'm your father, and I put my foot down when your life got put in danger. It's why I kept telling you not to go after her. Your mother isn't a good person, Yang. I don't want you to become like her. That's why I was hoping more of Summer would have rubbed off on you. Yang says that he can't know how well she would have turned out with Raven. Maybe actually knowing her mother would mean that she didn't have as many issues as she does now. Tai is quick to shoot her down there, telling her to think about it. If she had gone with Raven, she would have never known her father, never known her sister, probably never known Crow considering how well the two got along when Raven left. Yang folds a little into herself when the notion hits her. He continues that Yang would have never grown up with all of her friends that she had, with all the friends that she has now from Beacon. Raven offered a tribe. Tai offered a home, and damn it, he made the right call. He was hoping Yang would have more common sense during this discussion, but he blames himself for being too scared to broach it properly after she pulled the stunt she did when Ruby and her were children. Yang stands up, her arms case in hand, and her eyes cast to the side. She's shaking at this point, and after a moment of speechlessness, fumbles saying, We're done for today, before walking off. Tai watches her go and sighs, looking to the sky and saying, Yep, just like her mother as we get a smooth transition from Veil vale Sky to Mistrals. We pan down to find Ranger traveling to Higanbana, and unlike almost everything that came before this, this scene is 99% untouched up through the conversation with Raven. Only two things of note here. Ruby makes mention of how relieved she is she can recharge her scrolls since it and everyone else's scrolls died so she couldn't play her favorite games in her free time. And we get our first ever mention of Salem in this entirety of the fixing. Theoretically, we're just going to let that name simmer in the background for people to speculate over without much elaboration in this season. After Crow orders a double, we do a camera truck past the waitress so we can transition to the barracks of the White Fang base, where a mook is handing Adam a newspaper. Scrolled prominently on the menagerie mirror is a front page article about the wall breach and the brave efforts of a new guard recruit, Blake Belladonna, in repelling the invading Deathstalker with minimal casualties. Adam scowls at the paper, at least as well as one can scowl through a mask like that and crushes it, ending the episode. Episode 9 opens with a window sliding closed. We find the young Rima sneaking into a room and pulling up a chair next to a bedridden Aventine. The girl is pale, and while she's supposedly unconscious, her eyes are half-lidded. Remus begins talking to her softly, saying he'd heard that she wasn't well and the adults wouldn't let him see her. He says things have been weird around the farm, and he can't quite put his finger on why. Everyone seems... off. He even feels weird himself, like sometimes he just... doesn't care about things. That's why he became scared, so he came to check on Aventine. She doesn't respond, but there's a racket downstairs. Remus goes to the door and cracks it, listening out to a group of adults arguing about something just out of earshot. A few scattered words can be heard, some in concerned, even angry voices, some in decidedly apathetic tones. Through the door slit, we can see a man dressed in what appears to be Huntsman garb, heading to the door, clearly stating he's going to check out the well and see what the hell is going on. Remus pulls back and closes the door, returning to sit beside Ave. He touches her hand, saying that he hopes that she gets better soon, only for her to blink awake and start to cry in pain, a cry that should be familiar to those paying attention to the Fixing series. The adults hear the crying and burst into the room while Remus apologizes profusely to Ave if he hurt her. They scold young Remus Putnam dragging him out of the room as we get one last shot of Ave Brunswick crying. 
We transition over the crying with Weiss's singing, diving right into her gala performance for Jacques. This is another segment completely unchanged except for one camera angle at the conclusion of Weiss's song where she reacts with bafflement over the crowd's reaction to her singing. She literally just sang the My Dad is an Asshole song and no one cared. This will be important in the following scene which happens unhindered with Weiss meeting Henry Marigold, her breakdown over how shallow the gala and the people actually are, her summoning the Borbatusk to attack the lady who blamed Vale for the fall of Beacon, and Ironwood showing up to BAMF that summon into next week. When that's done, we transition over to Adam walking into the White Fang throne room. He approaches Sienna and inquires about her sending a new team to Menagerie to assist Fennec and Corsic in managing PR among Menagerie citizens. Sienna looks to him warily and asks why he would want to go to that position, to which he responds that Fennec and Corsic are old friends, and after the disaster at Beacon where one of his friends defected and where another was killed, he suggests that keeping close to his friends has become important to him. Sienna quickly shoots through his flimsy excuse, wondering if maybe the real reason he wants to go is because the defector he mentioned, Blake Belladonna, has just outed herself there and he wanted some form of revenge. No, he's already on a tight leash and he's staying that way. Even then, she's already chosen a candidate, and that's when Ilya enters the room, asking politely why Sienna wanted to see her. Sienna smiles and says that she's being sent to Menagerie to assist in the PR campaign. Adam looks over to Ilya, clearly livid. She gets Ilya caught up on the need to know, such as the fact that she'll be leaving in half a week before dismissing her. Sienna turns to address Adam, stating clearly that the Belladonnas are an important ally in reclaiming the credibility of the White Fang as a civil rights organization, and any personal vendetta with Blake should be shelved, or perhaps she'll have to reconsider her decision to keep him around. Adam growls, but Sienna cuts him off, frowning at him. She says that she's disappointed in him, that he had such a way of leading people and he squandered it being petty. She tells him to leave, and he complies, obviously angry as he stomps out the door. In our stinger, we get a new mysterious character, Tyrion Kalos, arriving at Higambara, asking where a particular person is, presumably a member of Juniper or Crow. Episode 10 opens with a slightly modified version of Ranger's approach to Oniyuri. Modified in that Ruby isn't stupid this time around, thinking walking cross continent will take about two weeks. Thankfully, our modified the trains are out of service setup fixes that so we can modify her dialogue to more or less groan about how the trip was only supposed to take, like, two weeks max, and now it's turned into a month walk cross country. All things being fair, there's not much else being changed, up until Ren starts really talking about the colonies that broke away from Mistral. When he mentions Mountain Glen, we change his phrasing from Anima's Mountain Glen to one of Anima's Mountain Glens. Because, come on, there's clearly multiple villages trying this experiment, why are you referring to Oniyuri as the only one? It's kind of weird. Additionally, when asked what happened, Shion immediately comes to mind for the rest of them. Bandits, Grimm, and Ren tightens his hand when he mentions one Grimm in particular, leading to confused stares from Ruby and John. Golden leaves swirl past the camera, transitioning us into Weiss's room. We get a mostly unchanged scene involving Weiss being scolded by Jacques, at least in tone. He shides her for making a mess of the gala, and in fact makes it absolutely firm that their deal is off meaning she won't be seeing Winter anytime soon. He's even more pissed about this because now he has to follow through with Ironwood to save face and keep his reputation of honoring deals. She wasted precious time he could have been using to build political capital. Weiss makes her declaration that she wants to leave Atlas. Jock declares that they're not talking about Weiss right now. This whole mess is about the family name, and Weiss is in a heated moment asks if Mr. Julie liked his song, which earns her a good old-fashioned slapping as a result. You know, fun times for all. She declares her goal to leave and uphold the family name as a huntress, and Jacques shuts her down hard, even stripping her of her inheritance. When Jacques leaves, Weiss finds Whitley just outside, who is smug as all hell about being named the new heir, declaring that he is all in on listening to Daddy Dearest. Instead of being stunned and passive about this in the hallway, Weiss is now in her doorway and slams the door on Whitley's face, because that's all the catharsis we're going to get out of that dynamic this whole volume. Returning to her room, she falls onto her bed and has a good cry. Then, when the cry has been well and goodly had, she sees a pair of airships fly past the window. She stands and pulls Mir and Naster out from under her bed, the box covered in a thin layer of dust. Without moving any furniture, because any more square footage in that room and it'll classify as a goddamn gymnasium, she poses with her weapon, loads a chamber, and closes her eyes in concentration. From a low angle, we track past the open box for Mir and Naster. We transition to an open suitcase where Ilya is packing for her trip to Menagerie. Behind her, just coming into frame, we can see Adam leading on the doorframe. Ilya catches him out of the corner of her eye and only spares him a glance before she continues packing. She entreats that, if he's going to talk, he should probably start now. Adam says he needs her to deliver a message to Fennec and Corsic. He wanted to hand it over in person, 
but he supposed that this was a blessing in disguise because he has a lot of work to get done in Mistral while Ilya is gone. He hands her a data chip containing the message, and she takes it, looking at it a moment before adding it to her suitcase, agreeing out loud as well. There's a quiet between them before he asks, You know what has to be done, right? Bring her home. Ilya quickly replies that she didn't need him to tell her that. She's also confident she'll be able to convince Blake to return. Adam laughs at her, but Ilya comments that she's seen Adam's tactics. Always the horns with him, never the hand. Ilya knows how to have finesse, and she's sure that she can make Blake see clearly just by talking with her. That gets Adam laughing even more, and he points out that humans have filled her head with too much crap. She shouldn't be surprised if Blake resists, and she shouldn't be afraid to result to whatever means she needs in order to bring Blake home, willing or not. Ilya snaps that she's not going to attack a friend, but Adam growls that Blake isn't so kind considering she more than willingly attacked him, and he points out that he and she were closer than anyone. That gets under Ilya's skin, and she bites her tongue. With her packing finished, she zips up her case and heads to the door. Before she walks out, Adam grabs her forearm and whispers in her ear, Big changes are coming, Ilya. Remember where your loyalties lie. Not to a leader, but to a cause. Ilya tries to pull away, and he lets her. She moves a few steps away from him and holds where he grabbed her, muttering weakly, I'm loyal to the Fang. It doesn't matter who's in charge. As the camera goes black. Back with Team Ranger, we get Tyrion's initial attack. The only real tweak is Ruby's meek, Me? response when Tyrion points to her. Instead, she's a little more aggressive, a little more concerned, a little less confused. Though, still confused. Remember, this guy is a complete stranger to both her and us at this point. But the rest of the scene plays out like before, Crow rushing in to save Ruby and all that. Crow says, Hey. And the camera cuts to black. Episode 11 opens back on the farm, which has fallen eerily quiet. We slowly pan upon Remus walking through the central yard, carrying two backpacks stuffed with supplies. He looks tired, the bags under his eyes heavy. He approaches one of the houses and simply pushes the unlocked door open, as though it had been left ajar. He works his way upstairs and opens the door to Aventine's room, where he sets both backpacks near the door. Remus approaches Ave's bed and begins speaking in a somewhat panicked tone. He says that something is wrong, that no one is waking up, so he started packing travel bags so they could leave together. He even snuck into her grandpa's storeroom to get that jam that she likes, even though the seller scares him. His words are shaky, as if he already knows that when he reaches out to touch her, her skin will be cold and she won't be breathing. Slowly coming to grips with the realization, Remus spends a minute fighting back tears and choking down sobs before he manages to compose himself, though it's very clear he's nowhere near stable. We don't see him leave the room, we only cut to near the door where the two packs were laid to rest, one of which remains and the other is now absent. Outside, we see Remus walking away from the farm, sparing it one last look before continuing on his way. Though slightly more distant, the well lingers prominently in the center of the frame. Our transition fades in on Beacon Tower, being viewed from a tent on the airship dock by Team Coffee, who are having a cup of... uh... coffee. To wind down after a long day of fighting. Despite the evident exhaustion, they appear to be in better spirits. Especially when Fox mentions he overheard a different team mention Professor Peach's group managed to secure the cafeteria once and for all. Velvet lets out a sigh of relief, remarking that it's almost over. Yansu Hashi smiles at her, but it sours when he looks over at the Weaver, still perched firmly atop the tower. He comments that unless they find a way to remove or destroy the Weaver, the campus will never quite be safe. Velvet just draws in a self-deprecating tone that it's certainly not for a lack of trying. Coco, who's working on her gun, comments that they'll figure it out, even if it means destroying the whole tower and using a crane to drag the damn thing away from Vale. Fox just sits back languidly and says that he's happy they're not going to be around for that job. Velvet corrects him, saying that they might not be around for the job. Their applications haven't been approved yet. He fires back, What are they gonna do? Reject us? Knock us back a year? You're underestimating how relaxed things are in vacuo. More than likely, they'll just throw us in with the third years and tell us to sink or swim. And frankly, I'm pretty good at the butterfly paddle at this rate. Butterfly stroke. Yatsu corrects him. Whatever, he says back. Velvet sighs back at him, scratching at the end of her half ear. She admits she feels like they're abandoning their post, but Coco quickly rebuffs that, saying that they're still in training. They were never meant to be on a job this big. They've been thrown into the deep end and they've been improvising, but they were never given the time to learn how to deal with something like this. Not even Lower Karen could have prepared them for this. At the mention of Karen, the team goes quiet. Coco sees this and stands, declaring that when they get to Shade, they'll ace their classes, kick the crap out of their missions, and make sure that nothing like Karen or Beacon ever happens to anyone ever again. Further, she sneers, if they ever get their hands on the bastards that did this to their school, they would make them pay, slamming her fist into her palm. 
From there, we transfer smoothly to Tyrion's tail, buffering up against Crow's sword. What follows is the same Tyrion and Crow fight we all know and love. There are some small tweaks, like Ruby actually, you know, aiming for Tyrion, and him leaning into the bullets with the same absent-minded glee as the original to demonstrate his more masochistic nature. Overall though, until the end, this is a very solid fight scene. At the conclusion, when Ruby goes to cut Tyrion, she actually aims for his head, and his only reaction is to use his tail to knock the attack off course, which ends with his stinger being cut off entirely. Wounded, the rest of Ranger move in to apprehend him, and when he tries to flee, Nora and Ren unload on him. He manages to duck behind cover to avoid Ren's shots, and when the team pushes forward to get him, he catches one of Nora's grenades to throw it back at the team, providing enough cover for him to finally escape. The rest of the scene plays out as normal, with the crew questioning Crow on who the man was and him asking what their favorite fairy tale is. Personally, my favorite fairy tale is the calming story that I have so many wonderful patrons. Wonderful patrons like Random Fandom, Toast Ghost, Jetty017, Melvin Sowa, Tanya B, JJ, Gone Rampant, Micah Dunn, The Dedicated Flashlight Man, Duke Dude Bro, George Thompson, Jonathan Jackson, Army Treyu, and Gabriel Guerra. Seriously, have I ever said you guys are the best? Because you guys are the best. And if you, uninitiated viewer, also want to be the best, consider supporting me on Patreon as well. For $1 or more, you get access to the Team Frostbite Discord server, The Tundra, where I, as well as other YouTube personalities, interact with our fans on the regular. Additionally, new patrons get a shout out in every full new video, like this Fixing Ruby series or one of my other reviews. I can't wait to see you guys in The Tundra when you sign up. But enough of pleasant fantasies. Back to the video. Starting episode 12, we find Remus in a Mistrali Berg, visibly gaunt and tired. His pack is empty and he wanders a busy street, his presence unacknowledged by the passers-by unless he bumps into them. He passes an open market and sees the food on display, making his mouth water, but after checking his pockets, he finds no money. He stands in place, his face conveying a rising sense of panic and desperation, and it's only when he catches another kid pickpocketing some adults that his face begins to still. He shadows the kid and winds up in a back alley where a small cadre of friends are pulling their own ill-gotten gains together. He approaches the kids, weak, and asks them to spare a few coins. The friends, being asshole pricks, most of which are Faunus, ask him who the hell he thinks he is, shoot him down, and tell him to get lost. He pleads again, and again the kids rebuff him, with one even taking an aggressive stance to intimidate Remus. Instead, Remus cries one last time that he needs the money before lurching forward and punching the kid trying to intimidate him. In the shadows, we see Remus and the kids fighting, beating the ever-living snot out of each other before only Remus remains standing. He collects the Lien from the ground and puts it in his own coin pouch. He's leaving the alley when the biggest kid asks who he is. He pauses, still winded from the fight, bruised, tired, and hungry, and in a moment he closes his eyes to steady himself. He opens them again, declaring, My name is Roman. Roman Torchwick. And these streets are mine now. Everything you steal comes to me, or else. And now we transition to... Ah, oh, Christ. Hey, can I maybe, like, just skip this and come back... Oh, we have to do this in chronological order, do we? Well, dandy. Okay, so we transition to Ranger around the campfire being caught up on what the hell is going on exactly. We don't lead in with Crow asking about there not being any questions. That single line opens this whole scene up to redundancy since the kids would logically just be asking for repeated information. Instead, we get Nora simply asking, So these maidens, there are four of them, and they all control different elements? Crow corrects her that yes, there are four of them, but they all just have blanket magic powers. They're named after the different seasons, but it's more of a title than anything reflecting their ability. Ren naturally follows that up by asking why the Maidens haven't been used to protect the world, to which Crow responds that they're powerful, but they're still mortal, and keeping close tabs on who becomes a Maiden is important. Theoretically, a random mugger could come up to a Maiden, jump her with a knife while looking into her eyes, and boom, the mugger becomes a Maiden. Worst case scenario, someone from the other side could get the power, and that could lead to disastrous consequences. He mentions the last time one of the Maiden powers went to a baddie, and the Great War soon followed. If the Maiden hadn't been killed by the Yellow Brick Bunch's secret organization back then, the results could have been apocalyptic. After that, they made it a goal to train Maidens to keep an intended target in the back of their minds just in case they get surprised and killed. But Cinder, or Ash, or whatever her name was, the woman responsible for the Vital Festival Tournament disaster, she found a way to get around the system without killing the Maiden. 
She managed to surprise him and Amber and siphon off part of her power, leaving her comatose. Worried they might lose the power to Cinder, they looked for a new candidate, and this is where John jumps in to finish Crow's sentence, realizing they were using the machine to transfer Amber's maiden power into Pyrrha. They forced it on her. Crow is quick to come to Osman's defense, however, saying they gave Pyrrha the options and laid out all of the facts. She could have walked away at any time. She made a choice. John snarls back that it was in the heat of the moment. She wasn't in her right mind. She had just killed someone for all she knew. Crow raises his voice and says that she made a sacrifice play that could have saved lives for all she knew. In the moment, it was the right call. John clenches his jaw and stands, walking away from the fire for a brief period. Ruby fills the gap asking about Tyrion and why he was after her. Crow goes on to say that having silver eyes is rare for a reason. It's a powerful weapon against the Grimm, and the forces against them took great pains to whittle down the numbers from small to almost non-existent. The fact Ruby managed to use her eyes at the top of the tower sounded an alarm bell that put a target squarely on her back. Ruby then asks the logical question, if she's so important, why hasn't he been traveling with them the entire time? To which John surmises Crow was using them as bait. He of course says it was more complicated than that, but John just goes off on him, about Ruby being hunted, schools being attacked, and none of the kids knowing what is even happening anymore. Crow tells him to cool it and sit down before asking how religious all the kids are. All but Ren shrug, and Ren explains he follows the three pillars of Tonfuism pretty closely. Crow asks if there's a creation myth to it, which Ren says most people use it as more of a philosophy than a religion, so myths have fallen by the wayside. Crow hums and smiles, stating it's good because what he's about to tell them isn't going to hurt anyone's faith. Because, the way Oz tells it, there's only one creation narrative that's correct. And this is where we launch into the creation narrative of the show, which is... surprisingly unchanged. Because honestly, it fits the unreliable narrator thing Ozpin has going on. He's not giving the full details to his recruits and in fact misleading them. The only thing to change about this explanation is when Ren asks what this has to do with any of them. Since, you know, learning the origin of your enemy might be important to the profession you've been trained to do. But the gods, the relic origins, the purpose of the schools, all those lines are just about fine. I think maybe the only tweak we need is that it's the teachers who guard the relics, not the students. The students aren't in on it, but the teachers, who are the best of the best huntsmen, are, which is why the academies are basically hubs for superb huntsmen. The end of this explanation is also where Crow drops Salem's name as the big bad they're trying to keep the relics away from. Replacing Ren's line about what this has to do with them, he asks the next logical step. Why doesn't anyone know about this? Why just a secret society and an underground war? Crow points first to his explanation of the Maidens, but then talks about how people would just flat not believe it. A malignant being who happens to be the source of so many ills in the world, one that has been plaguing humanity for centuries? Even if they had the Maidens parading in the streets doing a fireworks show with their magic, it'd be a hard premise to swallow. Hell, it took Crow years to realize the old man wasn't just blowing smoke about her, and he considers himself one of Oz's most loyal allies. With people relying more and more on the CCT for world news, they were actually discussing possibly creating a terrorist threat to blame for her actions to slowly inoculate the populace to her. But then Amber got injured before any of that could happen, throwing their plans for a loop. Ruby asks what Salem's endgame is, and Crow isn't quite sure since Oz was always very tight-lipped about that. But he knows one thing. She's trying to divide humanity, and so far she's done a bang-up job of it. If they let her succeed, it's more than likely they'll have another great war on their hands like last time, and their loved ones would be in the crosshairs just as much as the people trying to stop Salem. Nora asks if they should be double-timing it to Mistral if that's the case, but Crow assures her that there is time. After the attack, Lionheart will be on the lookout for problems, though it does concern Crow that the team they encountered, that being Cinder, Emerald, and Mercury, seem to have come from Mistral. There's no mention of Leo being out of touch with Ozpin or Crow in this version. Regardless, another attack like Beacon would be just as slow to organize, especially with the White Fang under an incredibly tight microscope from world leaders. Crow stands and dusts himself off, and decides to call it a night, and this is where we get a breakdown of his semblance. No real changes here, this is okay for the most part, except for his use of, my semblance isn't like most, which is entirely redundant to the concept of semblances. Someone's semblance could be making great potato salad. Semblances are kind of random like that. That's sort of the point. Anyway, the scene ends as normal, with Crow off for a walk, saying there's nothing else he'd like to tell them tonight. Back at Shinny Manor, Klein arrives outside of Weiss's room and speaks to her through the door. He's carrying a tray of food and he notices a similar, empty tray outside the door already. 
He expresses that he's concerned for her since she's kept herself locked away for several days now and hasn't come out. He's happy that she's been getting the nutrients she needs, but living life behind a lock isn't much of a life at all, even if her father was being a touch unreasonable. He doesn't get a response, and he sets the tray down, saying that it's there for her when he hears breaking glass. Dropping the tray halfway, Klein bursts through the door into the room without a second thought, worry about Weiss powering him through it. Inside, he finds Weiss, sweaty, ragged, and wearing more casual clothing. In front of her is a summoned armor Gygas, which bends its knee to her as she smiles. She turns to Klein and says that she needs a favor. Back with Ranger, we get Crow's poisoning kicking into high gear and him passing out, ending the episode. Episode 13 opens in the White Fang's menagerie office, in particular Fennec and Corsic's little shrine area somewhere near the back. The two are praying at their altar when Trifa, that once spider faunus, informs them that Sister Ilya has arrived. The two share a glance and stand to meet her. Outside, we find Ilya getting warm greetings from Yuma and Trifa, who she shares hugs with, implying some level of friendship. Fennec and Corsic greet her cordially and go through the generic, Hey, how are things? Good to see you. You'll be a wonderful help spiel. They say that her boat must have been fast because they were not expecting her arrival so soon. They can get her started on work tomorrow, but for now they recommend her getting situated on the island and resting. She accepts the suggestion, saying that she wants to go stretch her legs. Trifa and Yuma offer to show her around town, and she accepts, prompting the three to leave. The Albions retreat to their little sanctuary and play Adam's message. In it, Adam says he's trusting them as old friends to help him save the White Fang from a wave of moderation trickling into the organization. Unreal being overthrown has upset a plan that has and will benefit the White Fang greatly, and he needs their help to ensure the White Fang's continued success. He tells them that they're to use their unique way with words to slander Gira Belladonna and tarnish his reputation. Then, when he's at his lowest point, make sure he'll no longer be a factor. The message shuts off, and the Albions are left to meditate. The two figure out very quickly that Adam intends to coup Sienna, and with Sienna out and Gira unable to challenge it, Adam will easily fill a power vacuum. They question quite sarcastically what they should do before agreeing that they'll follow Adam's plan, to an extent. They muse about Sister Ilya and how horrible it would be if she got herself wrapped up in Adam's worldview, becoming so subservient to him. Yes, the other brother agrees. It seems, once Gira is out of the way, they'll have to turn her and Adam into the Kingdom Authorities, leaving another vacuum that they could take the place of. They begin to laugh, and we slowly dissolve over Ilya, saying goodbye to Trifa and Yuma. She eyes the Belladonna household in the distance and takes a deep breath before approaching it. She knocks on the front door, and Sun and Gira can be heard arguing about who's going to get the door, with Sun winning out because he's simply closer to it. He opens the door and greets her, and we get a nice little chuckle moment where Ilya questions if she has the correct house or not. She says that she's an old friend here to see Blake, and Sun and Gira welcome her in. While Gira goes to get Blake, Sun and Ilya sit around the table, and an awkward silence ensues. Ilya asks who Sun is, and he explains that he's a friend of Blake's from Beacon. She pushes a little further, asking, So, like, boyfriend from Beacon? And he just chokes on his tea like he did with Callie. He sputters that they're not a couple, not that he would mind getting together with Blake. They did go to the dance together and had a great time, but he recognizes Blake isn't really in the headspace for a relationship after everything that's happened. He asks when Blake and Ilya met, and Ilya openly admits that they met while in the White Fang when they were younger, around 11 or 12. Blake's one of her oldest friends. Sun sours it and narrows his eyes, muttering, White Fang, under his breath as Blake comes into the room. She's surprised to see Ilya, and a little uncomfortable when Ilya just stares at Blake a little longer than platonic friends probably should. Gira, who followed Blake, offers to get another cup of tea in order to extract himself from the conversation. Blake sits down next to Sun, and Ilya comments how lovely the house is, and Blake wryly remarks that's what happens when your dad becomes chieftain. The two sit in silence, and Sun actively calls out how awkward the atmosphere is. Ilya apologizes and says that she would have called ahead if she knew Blake's scroll number. Blake says that she ditched hers on the train to Vale so Adam couldn't track her. That seems to give Ilya a figurative kick in the ass, and she finally asks Blake why she left the White Fang. Blake recalls that she saw the changes that were happening in the Fang, the more violent tactics. And even though she went along with them, there was always something in the back of her mind that told her that it was the wrong path to take. Adam. Adam became the breaking point because at some point he went from someone she trusted on an instinctual level to being a monster willing to kill indiscriminately to get what he wants. And the worst part is, she saw all of those symptoms slowly spreading through the entire White Fang, despite what Fennec and Corsic have been saying about it being localized to the Vale unit. 
She's hopeful, hearing the news that Sienna is in charge. The woman always had a good head on her shoulders, and while she was always more extreme than Blake, she had a conscience and a moral barometer. Ilya shakes her head, saying that while her stomach churns knowing some of the things they've had to do while in the Fang, she thinks of all the successes they've had as a result of it. Consumer discrimination in Mistral down 30% and falling, the Atlesian Faunus work bill, cutting the pay gap in Vale. All of those were accomplished while Unrio took a more aggressive stance as their leader. Blake immediately asks what the cost of that was. Hate crimes across all the kingdoms rose. She's seen how the White Fang became the scapegoat for racists to torture normal Faunus. People were learning to fear the Faunus, not respect them. Ilya snarls that the humans should be afraid because that's how the Faunus had to live for centuries. It's only right that they get their just desserts. Blake stands, raising her voice, and asks, So what? An eye for an eye now? That's barbaric! We'll all go blind! To which Ilya replies, At least if we're all blind, we'll be equal. Sun actually interjects at this moment, contemplating the analogy mangling, and raises the point that that's not how the analogy works to Ilya, who simply barks at him to shut up. She stands and pokes Blake in the chest, saying that once the White Fang is in charge of things, the world will be a better place. Blake asks better how? Better like the Veil Breach, or the Fall of Beacon? And Ilya replies that if the humans fail to recognize them, then yes, like the Breach, like Beacon. Blake gasps at her, pointing out that Ilya is advocating genocide, and Ilya throws out, Better them than us! Blake is appalled and tries to explain that it's not how anything works, that humans and Faunus are in the world together and need each other, but Ilya pulls back and can't believe what she's hearing. After everything they'd experienced together in the Fang, after everything that Ilya told Blake about her parents dying in the Atlas Mines, after hearing about Ilya's school friends laughing at the mineshaft collapse, she thought Blake and her understood each other. Blake equally can't believe what she's hearing either. Ilya sounds just like Adam, justifying her hatred because she was personally affected by a small group of evil people. Ilya yells at Adam's right, all humans do our mock, degrade, and enslave the Faunus, and if Blake can't see that, then she really is a lost cause. Ilya glares at Blake, heartbreak written all over her face as she tears up. Her voice, however, maintains the anger and doesn't waver. I thought you were one of us. Blake replies, tired. I don't think I was ever one of you. Ilya shakes her head and stomps to the door, muttering, Adam was right. They filled your head with garbage. Outside of the Belladonna household, Ilya stands in place and holds back her emotions, swallowing them down before walking onward, Blake watching from the doorway the entire time. From the side, Kali and Gira pop in, commenting that that conversation didn't particularly go well, to which Blake reacts with indignance that they were eavesdropping on her. Without hesitation, they both answer yes, and Blake leaves with a groan. We swap over the patch, where Yang and Neptune are doing some light sparring as part of their rehab. Occasionally, one of Yang's punches with her mechanical arm will go off target, and she'll have to make some kind of adjustments, and equally, Neptune has to ask for breaks to sit down and rest his back. None of this stops Neptune from remarking how sluggish Yang has been the last few days, and he wonders aloud, if a little insensitively, if she's thinking about Blake. She snaps at him to shut up and flexes to punch him before self-regulating and cooling down. That doesn't stop her hair from flickering with some fire, though. This is when Ty steps in and comments how things have been tense around rehab lately, but he's hoping that having a new friend along for the ride may break the ice. He asks the two to say hello to their newest rehab buddy, Jane, and when he steps aside, we find Neo using her umbrella like a cane. We see Yang's eyes widen and flicker just as she launches forward and smoothly pins Neo to the wall. The minute they make contact, the screen goes to black, ending the episode. Episode 14 opens on a slide card dating it during the fall of Beacon on a black background. After a second of lingering, we abruptly cut into the action in first person from Neo's point of view as she goes flying into the air shortly following her and Tortrix's fight with Ruby. Due to budget limitations, we're keeping the camera very centered on the sky and maybe some flying rim in order not to be forced to make new assets in the new engine. Neo scrambles at her umbrella as it eventually buckles under her weight and inverts itself, causing her to tumble to the earth. On the way down, a griffin flies directly into her at high speeds, knocked off course by something, probably a huntsman, which breaks Neo's aura almost instantly. She finishes the fall, and we hear a series of sickening crunches as she hits the ground. The screen cuts to black. Seconds pass for the audience, though a time card tells us that even more has passed for Neo. Her eyes are bleary and half-lidded as she pulls herself towards where her parasol has landed, using only one arm when trying to use the other causes her to wince. She's almost to it when Roman's hat blows in on the wind and lands in front of her. 
She gingerly picks at it with her good arm and drags it to her, her vision blurring even more with tears as we hear sniffling. Her vision goes dark. When her eyes open again, she's being wheeled through a hospital corridor by one tired-looking doctor and two orderlies, as well as a medic that's informing the doctor of what they know about her. She was found by rescue workers, her aura was barely keeping her alive, and her scroll had been smashed so they didn't have an accurate reading on what her aura's strength or durability was. Again, she fades out. We jump ahead when she opens her eyes staring at a doctor, sighing in frustration. The doctor says, that's a shame, before writing down on his clipboard. He says that, since she can't remember anything, they're putting down her name as Jane Doe, which is the name they found on her Atlas military uniform. This is an incredibly ironic name because I'd planned this long before I learned that Doe is a name that can be applied to a color palette skewing from light pink to brownish pink. I'd initially wanted to make a remnant-specific version of the Jane Doe trope, but that coincidence was too good to pass up once I'd heard it. Now, do note this isn't the remnant-specific version of the Jane Doe trope. That's just a bit of cheeky in-joke for the viewers. Jane Doe is the name of the corporal she stole the uniform from. Why did she steal it? Well, when you go undercover, it's easier to have an outfit that you can just put on each day as opposed to making a new one from scratch each day where you might end up messing something up. Back to the scene, the doctor explains that she still needs plenty of rest and that they predict that she'll heal in about a month what with how weak her aura is. He stands to leave and suggests that she get some more rest while she can and tries to move Roman's hat from her lap so that she can be more comfortable. She refuses, holding onto it with a death grip before the man relents and lets her keep it with her on the bed. The man leaves and she looks at the hat, blinking, which cuts us forward in time to her sitting on the side of the bed, her umbrella at her side and Roman's hat barely peeking out from a bag on the floor. She pulls a strand of her brown hair and squints. It begins to match the pink shade we normally see, but after a moment of concentrating, the illusion dissolves, leaving Neo with plain brown hair. Taiyang walks into the room and introduces himself as her outpatient physical therapist, remarking on the great progress she's made with Dr. Birch. He has faith that, with a little grit and gusto, he'll have her overcoming her frailty in no time. When she next closes her eyes, we cut to the present where Yang is pinning Neo to the wall. There is quiet as Neo quickly assesses the situation. Thinking on her feet, she shares a brief smirk with Yang before feigning pain from Yang's assault. Neptune and Tai rush to pull the two apart, with Tai handling Yang and Neptune supporting Neo. Yang struggles against her dad's grip, asserting, in a voice that's not quite a yell, that that girl is Neopolitan, Roman Tortric's right-hand woman. Tai looks between the two curiously, frowning when he turns to Yang and tries to talk her down, insisting this girl is named Jane Doe, not Neo. He apologizes profusely to Neo, or Jane in this instance, which only serves to piss Yang off more. Yang stomps her foot and says that she knows what Neo looks like, and Tai just fires back that yes, Yang might know what the other girl looks like, but can she honestly say that she trusts what she sees, referencing back to how Yang's hallucinations are a known problem. He implores Yang to look again, and she does. We cut to Yang's perspective where she blinks her eyes, and we now see our traditional version of Neo disappear between blinks. Where the suit was is now a more casual shirt and sweatpants, where the hair had pink and white strands is now a lifeless brown, and her eyes maintain a normal mahogany shade instead of the presupposed heterochromia. Yang falters, her face falling. She begins to mutter to herself, apologies slipping out of her lips, though much of what she says is largely indiscernible. Breathing heavily, Yang grips her chest and slides to her knees, with Tai swooping in just in time to keep her from collapsing entirely. He asks Neptune to come help, which he does after setting Jing Do down on the bench. Tai asks if Neptune can take Yang home since Jane needs to start her therapy. Neptune agrees and gently pulls Yang out of the scene. Neo watches her leave, smiling, though hides it when Tai begins to fret over her. She very skillfully returns to the wounded puppy routine and in fact gives Yang the benefit of the doubt when Tai apologizes for her again, blowing off the apology as unnecessary, at least as best as she can convey through simple body language. We hear Adam's voice saying, the gears are in motion, as we smoothly cut over to him back in the tavern, sitting down with the first appearance of Hazel. Hazel appears pleased by the news and asks if there's a timetable and Adam says that he only needs another month for all the pieces to be in place. There are a few Sienna loyalists he needs to figure out what to do with. He doesn't want to kill good soldiers if he doesn't have to, and Hazel expresses approval of a bloodless coup, though Adam remains silent on that matter. Instead, he invites Hazel to attend the festivities when they take off. Hazel questions how strange it'll be for a human to walk among the White Fang, but Adam assures him that Hazel won't be bothered or harmed, even though that concern never really crossed Hazel's mind. 
He instead remarks that Adam has cut it close to the deadline, and Adam defends himself that pulling something like this off isn't exactly child's play. Hazel recognizes this, and as a token of faith in Adam's ability, he's gone ahead and fulfilled one of Adam's requests as a part of the deal. He passes a folder to Adam, who hesitates before opening it. We never see what's inside the folder, but Hazel starts to speak, giving us an idea as to what it contains. Their man from Atlas searched high and low for any police records or identification numbers. Not easy now that Atlas is going even deeper into high alert. There's even concerns about a full-on embargo on travel, to and from the kingdom. We see a pain look on Adam's face as Hazel explains that she'd been dead for years, and that the only indication was an obituary buried in a Faunus newspaper. Their hacker pulled a few more strings and found out the police never investigated despite the plurality of evidence, probably because it was her debt-holding master that killed her. This remark has Adam clench his hands, shaking. Hazel apologizes for Adam's loss, only for Adam to cut him off saying, Don't. She was weak. His voice is clipped, and not exactly strong. He thanks Hazel for the information, but Hazel halts him, saying, Weak as she may have been, family is family. If I were you, I'd commit that man's name to memory. Adam grits his teeth and spits out, I already know it by heart. He tells Hazel they'll meet again in a month, and this time he should dress to the nines. With that, he walks out into the night. We pull back from the night sky into Yang's window. She's sleeping soundly in her bed when the window is popped open by Neo's umbrella blade. Neo sneaks onto Yang's bed and positions herself to kill Yang, only for Yang to startle awake. She kicks Neo off her, sending her slamming to the floor not too far away and causing Neo's wounds to flare up, making her flinch. Bleary-eyed, Yang scrambles for her mechanical arm on the bedside but begins to hyperventilate in panic. She drops the arm and slips out of the bed to the floor. By this time, Neo has recovered and has scrambled to straddle Yang with the blade, similar to how she lingered over Yang during her fight in Season 2. Yang tries reaching for her arm, not thinking clearly in the panic, before seemingly losing her will to fight. She looks up at Neo and stares right into her eye, Neo gloating with her facial expressions and Yang just defeated. Yang lets her head hit the baseboard as the screen cuts to black. Her words close the episode out. Just get it over with. The next episode opens with Roman, now a young adult, collecting money from a few nondescript thugs in Mistral's back alleys. One seems to not pay up as much as he was supposed to, and Roman glares the extra sum out of him. He continues his stroll, only to arrive upon an alley where he finds a trio of kids standing over a fourth, who they're currently kicking the snot out of. The girl, who we will learn shortly is Neo, curls in on herself and takes the blows, but does little to defend herself. Roman is about to brush it off and leave when he hears the whimpers of Aventine leak into his head. He pauses mid-step before turning around and telling the kids to scram. The bigger ringleader ignores him only for Roman to bash him over the back of the head with his cane. The kids run off after that and Roman leans down to Neo's side, remarking that the girl looks like a mess. The girl, struggling, manages to project half an illusion that makes her look cleaner in appearance. Roman smiles at this, even as it flickers and breaks into small shards of glass. He comments how unique her skills appear to be, and he promises to help her in return for her working for him. He flips his cane around and offers the other end to her. She reaches forward and takes it. The scene blurs, and where the cane was is now Neo's blade, and where Neo was is now Yang. Realizing we're now looking from Neo's perspective again, she blinks, and we see young Neo on the ground where Yang is. She blinks again, and Yang is back. Her hands begin to tremble. We finally break free of her perspective, and Yang begins to goad her into doing it, Asking what's the holdup, just do it! Neo brings the blade down into the floorboard next to Yang's head. Yang just stares at her as she uses the cane's blade to stand, her hands trembling. She walks off Yang and goes to collect the other half of her parasol elsewhere in the room, limping from where Yang kicked her as she does. Yang lies there next to her bed and begins to laugh, slowly and bitterly. Through the laughs, she says, God, this sucks. The one time I can die without feeling guilty about it and somehow I even managed to screw that up. Neo looks at Yang and goes to stand over her, rolling her eyes noticeably. Yang tells her not to look at her like that. She's not just being dramatic. At the rate she is going, she's collecting problems like trading cards. Get the whole set and get crippling depression free! Mumbling as an afterthought, it doesn't even come with gum. That little line earns an amused huff from Neo. Footsteps are heard outside of the door, and Neo shares a look with Yang before vanishing behind an illusion, though it appears shaky considering how much of the air seems to wobble. Yang's door is opened by Tai, who had heard some of the noise and was concerned. Yang pauses for a minute, looks where Neo was, and apologizes to her dad for waking him, explaining she had a nightmare. He sighs in relief and rolls off the apology since he wasn't sleeping anyway. He was actually doing some early morning jogging. He was just coming in when he heard some strange noises. With her okay, he goes to leave. 
asking if she needs anything. She says no, but he lingers. He admits things have been weird between them, and he's sorry about that. The more he reflected on what she said at rehab, the more he decided to look into Jane's origins, just in case. He tapped an old friend in the police force to look into her, but with the reclamation and reconstruction efforts still going on, he doesn't expect it to be a fast turnaround. Until he hears back, he'll keep the two at a distance, just in case, and keep his eyes open around her. Yang hesitates to respond, but ultimately thanks him and tells him that she loves him. He reciprocates and finally leaves. A few seconds later, Neo reappears, her illusion shattering quickly and her breath being ragged. Her eyes are wide and it's clear in her body language she's feeling exhausted from the illusion and awkward from the conversation. The two look at each other and Yang voices what's on both their minds. So... What now? We swap over to Menagerie where Blake is in the middle of a shift with another guardsman. He keeps stealing glances at her and she notices but brushes it off silently. When she and her partner find a crying child, she goes to comfort them and asks where his parents are. He cries about how he lost them, but his mother quickly appears, looking at first with relief at him, but then with concern when she sees who's standing next to him. She quickly moves in and pulls him away from Blake, never letting her eyes leave Blake. The two walk away without a single word, which leaves Blake confused. This confusion doesn't last long as Sun approaches, calling Blake's name, holding a copy of the Menagerie Mirror and asking if she's read it this afternoon. She hadn't. She stayed up too late reading books with her father, so she had to rush out the door or otherwise be late to her shift. Sun holds up his copy and shows her an article that presents Gira Belladonna as either a hypocrite or as ineffective. Blake reads the important bits out loud, letting the audience get up to pace as quickly as she does. It lays out that Gira's position of a peaceful relationship with the humans has received mixed reactions, with some even questioning his rise to chieftain status as a result. New accusations of human sympathizing has arisen, while at the same time, his daughter, the Kuokuana famous Blake Belladonna, has returned from her time as a terrorist extremist in the White Fang. Blake quickly becomes enraged by the article's portrayal of her, her eyebrows shooting to her hairline. The people around them hear her exclamation, and she shares wary looks with all of them. She continues to read that sources inside the White Fang link her directly to the Veiled Chapter responsible for the fall of Beacon, and confirm that her father was too limp-wristed to stop her from joining the organization he himself dubbed a terroristic threat. She looked stunned at Sun, emphatically stating that she left BEFORE it had become a terrorist organization. It was still violent, but neither her nor her father knew how things would escalate, and she got out when she saw what was coming. Sun goes like, why are you telling me? I know all that, but the people don't, and everyone I've run into have seen this thing. I think they've printed extra copies because I've been seeing these things littering around the entire town. This is when they hear laughter. They turn their heads and find Ilya smirking at them, and Blake quickly puts together Ilya was behind the propaganda. She admits to it freely, though quietly, rein in the conversation to be between the three of them and not broadcast her machinations to the crowd that's slowly circling around them. She says that this is what Blake gets for abandoning her cause, abandoning the people she fought alongside for abandoning her friends. This actually stings Blake because unintentionally that's exactly what she did with Ruby, and to a lesser extent with Ilya, leaving her speechless. Son steps in and says Ilya is talking a load of crap, but Ilya is prepared to shoot at him that he should be prepared for when she abandons him. To everyone's surprise, he manages to fire back immediately. She tried, and you know what I did? I chased her down and asked her what was wrong. I offered to help her work through her thoughts, and sure I might not have been the best at giving her the space that she asked for, but it's better than showing up to drag her back into a cause you believe in. Blake always came first, and if you never considered that, you were a bad friend, so back off. Ilya physically backs off at the reprimand, now as speechless as Blake is. Her skin flushes red, and small specks of tears are actually pulling in the corners of her eyes. She moves forward as if to attack them, but then pulls back and yells, You can't escape your past, Blake. All of Menagerie is going to know you were one of us. The door to come home won't be open much longer. With that, Ilya runs off. Sun just mutters that Ilya seems to have a lot of personal problems, and she should probably stop taking them out on Blake. Blake just looks at him and thanks him for standing up for her, crying a little bit at his words. He gives her a playful punch in the shoulder and tells her it's what friends are for. He suggests that she take work off early. They can get some food, get back to her house, and talk with her dad about this hit piece. She sniffs and agrees, and they walk off together, with the camera trailing down to frame one of the many crumpled and discarded copies of the Menagerie Mirror before fading to black. Episode 16 picks up in Yang's room, again at night as Neo is entering her window. This has some recurrent elements with the first time this happened, with similar intense camera angles and threatening tone. We see Neo's arm raise high and come down quickly like she's about to hit someone, only for the camera to pull back that she's slapping one of Yang's hands. 
They're sitting across from each other, Yang scrolling between them with a series of words projected onto it. Frequently, Neo points to the words and does a sign with her hands, and it's quickly conveyed that she's teaching Yang sign language, and she corrects Yang with a light slap of her hands. All in all, it's a learning process for Yang and her mechanical arm, which isn't used to doing fine motions quite as dexterously, and it's implied with how Yang speaks to Neo that they've been at this at least a couple of days. Eventually, Yang says that there's something that she's been practicing signing herself, and she wants to see if Neo could understand it. Through subtitles, we see her sign out, Why didn't you kill me? Which leaves Neo stumped for how to respond. She eventually thinks about it, and does a few quick signs that don't get subtitled so we're along with Yang for the ride, especially because she reads out the sign as, We are... Bacon? Neo shakes her head and remakes the last symbol, and Yang corrects herself, Oh, we're the same. We're the same? What does this have to do with bacon? Neo picks up the scroll and begins to type. We can do some artsy stuff here, only having Yang's face illuminated by the moon in the screen. Neo says, through typing, we are alone. Yang studies Neo before remarking, Oh yeah, you lost Roman, didn't you? You two were close? To this, Neo nods. So he was your dad? Neo thinks for a moment before giving a half-hearted shrug. Was that a yes? Yang asks. Neo shakes her head no. Was that a no? Neo shakes her head no. Was he your boyfriend? Again, Neo gives a confused shrug. Yang's eyes widen as she processes the answer, and saying, Okay, look, there's a very clear line between those two. There should not be any ambiguity. Neo flounders, clearly unable to convey it. She stops Yang from talking and waits for a moment to think. She then goes about signing the word for love. You loved each other. Neo nods, and then follows up by typing, He took care of me. I took care of him. He's gone now. Yang nods at that. I guess I can relate. Dad, Mom... Ruby, they all love me. I guess I know that much. John, Nora, Ren. It was hard enough losing Pyrrha. I couldn't imagine if it were Weiss or... Blake. Yang lingers on the last name. Neo cocks her head to the side, peeked at the name. You know, the one in black with the bow? Neo nods. She is just... Weiss was taken away. Ruby's out on some kind of mission. Blake... She just left. Neo signs out, are you mad at her? Yang is about to speak, but hesitates, then says, no, I don't... I think I'm just disappointed. I know her, she gets scared, but I thought we worked through that. I guess I was wrong. Yang begins to slip again, but Neo slaps her shoulder, asking, what is the sign for Pickle? Yang tries to brush her off, that she's done for the night, only for Neo to stop her, insisting, what is the sign for Pickle? Yang tries to shove her off, but Neo avoids it and insists, with the word pickle taking up most of the screen. Yang, frustrated, signs the word, which is visibly complex for her fingers, and asks, Happy? Neo nods with a satisfied smile. This might seem like a bit of jarring comedy, but it's actually rather important for Neo to jolt Yang out of depression setting in. As well as serving as jarring comedy, because again, people seem to think this take on Ruby is super depressing and edgy. But that's just because the comedy is rarely plot relevant and isn't notable in summary format. How many times do I have to say that? I mean seriously guys, I've been saying this since like volume 2. We transition out through Yang's window and in through a window in the rafters of the Belladonna residence. Below, in the center of the living room, Gira has just finished practicing a speech for what Sun says is the hundredth time. An exaggeration, of course, but Sun recommends Gira give it a rest before he wears himself ragged. Memorizing things is all well and good, but burnout can kill. Mentioning one time at Beacon where Weiss stressed herself out so much over a test that for an entire week she tried to stab anyone that bothered her. Gira blinks, noting how unhealthy that child sounded, questioning if a schnee should really bend under that much pressure. Blake enters the room and points out that Weiss was normally better at keeping her cool, but Ruby had actually gotten a better score on a test than her the prior week, and that fact was driving her mad with jealousy. They ironed out their issues in Season 1, but that doesn't mean Weiss was perfect afterwards, she's still human. Blake asks how the preparations are going, and Gira actually compliments Sun on his ability to help. He might be a little less... eloquent, but he has a good ear for making speeches sound more... natural and less prepared. Sun basks in the praise, giving himself a pat on the back, though Gira is quick to tell him not to ruin the moment, and he quickly complies. Blake wonders out loud how it came to this, but Gira explains that this is part of being in politics. There's always an angle people are willing to take on you. Normally, though, issues like this don't linger very long. 
which means that this is a more serious issue that actually warrants a statement. Compounding this, the head of the Democratic Council movement, a key political ally of Gira, accidentally fed into the rumors with innocuous comments that were taken out of context, creating a perceived rift between the two among the public even though they're on good terms. He's not happy that it's come to making a grand address, but he's at least happy to have Blake there at his side. He asks how her speech is coming, and Callie pops in with a tray of tea, saying that Blake still needs a little work. Blake elaborates that talking about how the White Fang became a terrorist organization isn't exactly easy to prep around. Talking about using Grimm as weapons and murdering civilians, including other Faunus, is a turnoff to most crowds. The screen shifts in color, and it becomes framed like a video recording, revealing that what we've been watching has actually been on Ilya's scroll. She's in the Menagerie White Fang base, showing the footage to Fennec and Corsic, both of whom are pleased with the information, but displeased with the results. They dismiss her and mull over what to do about the situation. Concerned with how charismatic Gira is and how firm Blake's refutation of the White Fang is, they decide to move up their timetable. They also discuss how Ilya is under orders from Adam to apprehend Blake, not kill her, so they have to modify their initial endeavor, committing the assassination themselves and framing Ilya through evidence as opposed to having her commit the hit and suffer the fallout immediately. Back with Rehab, Yang is still doing warm-ups when Tai approaches, with Neo in tow. Neptune is also there, but this is his last day of rehab by all appearances, being able to fully walk again now. Side note, totally forgot to mention this earlier, but Neptune has a spinal implant as a part of that program Ironwood set up back in Yang's first episode. I intended to have it come up at some point during the dialogue, but I completely forgot to write it down in the summary, so I'm putting it here now. So, uh, better late than ever, right? Okay, back to the meat of things. Yang pulls her father and Jane aside and admits that she may have been wrong like he thought, and that Jane isn't Neo. His face flickers through a number of emotions that indicate that he's not quite 100% sure she's being sincere, but he can at least tell that she's trying to make peace. He doesn't stare a gift horse in the mouth, thanking Yang for being honest about it and saying he's proud of her for apologizing. Yang follows that up by inviting Jane for a little sparring, to which Neo hesitates, unsure where this new dynamic is going. Neo, however, does eventually nod, even when Tai tries to object. Yang promises to go easy on her, it'll just be a light warm-up together, and the two get into position. They share more friendly, confident smirks between each other, and begin, with them rushing at each other being the last frame of the episode. In episode 17, we pick up with Blake at an evening shift at the guard's headquarters, reviewing the speech she's going to give while on break. Sun walks in, ending his shift and removing his armor, asking where Captain Saber is, and Blake just says that he had a meeting with her dad over the current protective details during his address. Basic stuff like that. She also says that, uh... Blanchard? It, yeah, let's go with the name Blanchard. She says that Blanchard, the other guard manning the desk with her, is out helping someone else. It's been a slow day. He nods and goes to the back room, presumably to finish changing. This is when Trifa walks in and asks if someone could help her find her missing cat. It ran off in the morning and she's just so worried about it. Blake sighs and stands, closing her scroll and yelling back to Sun to man the desk for a few minutes while she goes to help out. She follows Trifa out and as they walk and talk, Blake begins to recognize Trifa as someone that she has passing knowledge of in the Fang, but it takes her a minute to put the pieces together. She starts to voice this when they come across an alleyway where Ilya is waiting for them. Blake figures it out just in time for Trifa to wrap her up in webbing. Ilya laments that Blake's gone soft to have fallen for the oldest trick in the book, but Trifa defends her half-heartedly, saying that she's cut her hair and her old dyes have washed out, she looks pretty different than when Blake would have known her. Another three White Fang members emerge around the alley surrounding Blake. Ilya apologizes for the sneak attack, but Blake has made it clear where she stands. She would have rather done this without using force, but the more she thought about what Blake said, about what the White Fang was planning, she knew all along that bringing her home was going to be a physical endeavor, not a diplomatic one. If she won't walk through the door that Ilya has opened, she'll be dragged through, kicking and screaming until she sees it's the right thing to do. Blake lashes back that it's not the right thing to do, asking Ilya to really look at herself, what she's doing. This is what the White Fang has become. This is why she left. No longer were people being given a choice to change, they were just scared into silence and that only started to breed more contempt. Ilya snaps that they already have contempt for the Faunus, and Blake and her family are only holding the Faunus back from a real solution to protecting them from humans. Blake asks in what world is it okay to attack innocents, and Ilya turns around and declares there are no innocents, there's no right thing to do, just what's best for the Faunus. She hates hurting people, but fear has gotten them results, out of the people who hurt them and the ones who stand by and let it happen. She learned that years ago when she wanted her schoolmates, her friends, to just stop laughing. They did, after she beat them to a bloody pulp. 
The only recourse would have been expulsion and being sent home, both of which were going to happen anyway now that her parents weren't going to be sending any more money. She ran, she found the White Fang, found a home, found a purpose and a method, and now Blake would put her foster family on a trajectory that would destroy everything she's come to learn about the world. Blake shoots back how good that worldview has been for her now that she's in the business of threatening her friends. Ilya responds that she'd do anything for the greater good. Blake asks if Ilya thinks killing her will be for the greater good, and Ilya responds, no, but getting rid of your family is. Blake goes into shock and begins to resist her binds more than she already was, stating that she won't let Ilya hurt them. Ilya just coolly says that she knows Blake won't, and that's why she's being shuffled off to Adam and Mistral. And this is where we get Ilya's confession. When Blake pleads that this isn't Ilya, Ilya points out that Blake was so busy fawning over Adam that she never noticed Ilya. She confesses her jealousy and how no one can always get what they want. She motions to her cohorts, saying two are with her and the other two are to get Blake back to the ship. She gives Blake a watery, pained look before saying, See you soon, and leaving. Blake squirms in place and we can see her trying to use her semblance to escape, only for the webbing to duplicate with her shadow. She screams after Ilya, and when Trifa and the other White Fang member go to lift her, she channels a bit of Yang by kicking the man and headbutting Trifa. Disoriented from the headbutt, both girls struggle for a second and the man rises to his feet, only to be knocked out by Sun. The man collapses and Sun reaches for Gamble Shroud on Blake's back. He pulls it free, cutting her binds in the process. Blake phases free completely, grabs Gamble Shroud, and knocks Trifa out. Sun turns to her, confused and worried, saying how he saw Ilya come from the direction Blake had gone with the woman. Blake brushes him off and quickly explains that the White Fang are after her father, and they need to go home now. They look down at the two unconscious White Fang members, look to each other, and we cut to just outside the guard's headquarters, where the two have been handcuffed to a pole, with Blake and Sun running off down the street in the distance. We cut over to Mistral, where we get Sienna's death, almost completely untouched from Volume 5. I don't think there are many major concerns that need to be addressed. Maybe Hazel not being quite in on the plan, but that's why I had Adam stay quiet when Hazel suggested a bloodless coup. But yes, it goes off without a hitch, and Sienna is summarily dethroned via execution. So long, Sienna. I hope I did you more justice than the Volume 6 trailer did. As Sienna rolls to the ground, we get a spinning descent shot on her corpse, and transition to a similar shot over an unconscious crow being carried on a stretcher. While we don't get the parallel line read of Blake and Ruby saying, just hold on, I feel the visual parallel of Sienna dying and Crow injured creates a stronger, more immediate concern for his life. Crow is hallucinating a discussion with Ty and John points out that he's getting worse. Ruby asks her uncle just to hold on a little bit longer. Another day's walk and they'll be in Sakura So, where the airship Linehart called for will meet them with some doctors. Nora's a little salty over the fact that it was only after mentioning Crow that Lionheart was willing to pull the extra strings, especially because if he had pulled a few earlier, they wouldn't even be in the situation. But Ruby tells her what's done is done, complaining about it now won't do much. John broaches the idea of calling the airship directly, or Sakura So, and having someone meet them halfway, but Ruby points out that all their scrolls are dead after a week straight without charging. Their last bit of power was used for Crow's scroll to make a call to Lionheart. The five approach a signpost, indicating Higambana, Kuchinashi, Mistral, and Sakura So to the right, and Kuroyuri to the left. Debate erupts on which path to take. Try to make it up the mountains to cut the distance and beeline for Sakura So, or go around the mountains through Kuroyuri. Ren emphatically supports the mountain route, even though John points out Crow is in no condition for the climb. It's actually a little more extended in this rendition, with John and Ren actually raising their voices over the problem. Ren is strong in saying that Kuro Yuri was destroyed years ago and isn't safe. It'd be wasting time they didn't have. John fires off that Crow's aura isn't recharging like it should, and one bad step could send him to his death, bringing any one of them with him. Ruby looks between the two, indecisive about which path to take. And as the argument fades to a dull roar, we can hear Pyrrha's voice quietly whisper behind Ruby's thoughts as she stares at Crow. Nora finally bursts in, yelling that it's enough. They're getting nowhere by arguing. She instead insists they split up. Her and Ren can take the mountain path and meet the airship at Sakura So and lead the rescue crew right to Ruby, John, and Crow while they hunker down in Kuro Yuri. They might even be able to scour for supplies while they're there. Ren clenches his teeth and growls that anything there would have rotted away years ago, but Nora rests a hand on his shoulder to quiet him. John goes to refuse, that he doesn't want anyone to split up. The last time they did, well, Pira happened. That sends the group into silence as they all contemplate over the decision. Nora again steps up and refuses what John's saying. They all know now that Pira made a choice, 
and all the choices have consequences. She had to live with that, and so do they no matter what they do. After saying this, Nora actually cast her eyes off to the side, a small figment of shame to her features. Ruby moves forward and swallows. She says that Nora is right. They need to choose a plan and stick to it. She turns to John with an apologetic look and says that it's probably best if they do split up. Nora and Ren can move faster without them to get help. John asks why Ruby wouldn't rush ahead, since she's the fastest of them, but she looks to Crow and says that if anything happened to her, there would be no one to help her. Ren and Nora are used to moving well together, and Ruby just can't leave her uncle behind. The four share short, affectionate smiles before hugging each other and going their separate ways. Ruby tells John to have some faith that they'll be fine, which he finds difficult to do. As they walk away, we pan back to see the two smaller parties going in relatively opposite directions, and in the mud behind them is the lingering hoofprint of the knuckle of E. Episode 18 opens onto... <sighs> the Belladonna assassination fight. God damn it. In the original version, the only good section of this fight was Blake vs. Ilya and the gunchuck moment, which was honestly too short for its own good. Okay, so we open on Fennec and Corsic preparing themselves for the fight, doing some ritualistic chanting to themselves to get in that zen mindset to take a life, and also sending up a prayer to that fox figure on the wall. It won't really be touched upon, but this guy on the wall is one of the originators of Fauna Superiority ideology, revered somewhat like a messiah or a past papal figure to the extremist Faunus. With their preparations complete, they head out the door, the smoke of their incense becoming the focus of the foreground. We fade in from that to wafts of steam coming off a cup of tea in the Belladonna household, where Gira and Saber are having a pleasant discussion over the protective details of Gira's upcoming speech. Just as they're winding down for the conversation to more casual fare, the lights cut out, leaving them both confused. Saber stands and checks the window, noting the Belladonna house is the only one without power. He and Gira become alarmed by this, only to be interrupted when one of the guards outside is thrown through the door with a blade sticking out of his chest. Cali and the cat guard come out of a different room, confused by the ruckus, only to be told to go back to where they came from to find a place to hide. The Albions rush into the room, followed closely by Yuma. The bat Faunus glides over Gira and Saber, slipping into the door behind Cali and the guard. Gira turns to chase them, but is thrown to the side by a dust-based attack launched by Corsic. He tuts at Gira and Saber, lining up beside his brother and a small handful of other white fang that came to the door behind them. Fennec very politely asks Gira to make this easy for them. Gira and Saber share a quick glance before charging forward to create a fray. We cut to Kali and the guard, who are fleeing through the home from Yuma. He casually tosses a grenade over his shoulder at the door, and it explodes into a solid wall of ice that keeps it shut. He just taunts that no one is coming for you, ladies, before drawing his pistols and opening fire on the two as they pass into the circular tea room. Callie's guard flips a table and quickly returns fire. Yuma retreats behind a pillar, and the two begin a short firefight, during which both get a number of hits in. Unfortunately, the cat girl's aura gives out first. She screams after the last shot connects and collapses, still conscious but too injured to fight. Yuma begins to stalk forward, only for Callie to pick up the gun and fire back. Her shots go wide, but there are enough to spook Yuma, at least for the three shots she gets off before the magazine goes dry. Callie curses and dives back behind the table. Yuma again stalks towards their cover. Thinking quickly, Callie grabs a tipped tea tray, and the cat girl looks at her with confusion and disbelief. Callie gives a look that conveys, well, what have we got to lose? So when Yuma rounds the corner, he's hit squarely in the face with the sheet, breaking his aura and knocking him out cold. Callie and the guard look from the tray to the unconscious Yuma and share a I can't believe that worked moment before we cut away. Back with Gira and Saber, they're holding on surprisingly well with the White Fang. Gira has grabbed the table in the room and is using it as a shield so Saber can get up close and cut down mooks with his sword. When the table inevitably breaks, Gira grabs one of the two remaining mooks and tosses him at Fennec only for Fennec to dodge to the side and allow the Mook to end up hitting the other remaining White Fang stooge, sending them both into the wall behind him, collapsed. Fennec runs forward at him, but is stopped by Saber, engaging in a brief duel that is interrupted when both Gira and Corsic try to back up their allies. The four begin to circle, looking for an opening, and Gira openly questions the brothers' approach. They're both so careful with their words, so calm and calculated, a frontal assault doesn't fit their kind of strategy. Flippantly, they acknowledge the idiosyncrasy, that it is in fact very unlike them to do something like this, isn't it? It's almost as if someone more youthful and bold had decided to carry out the hit instead. Of course, the Albions will publicly decry Gira's death, and they'll make sure the true troublemakers will be brought to justice in his wake. The rogue faction within the chapter would be expunged immediately for their heinous crimes, and the Albions would go on a long-winded apology tour for not having kept a tighter leash on their subordinates. While everyone is talking, they're actually secretly charging their weapons behind their backs or under their cloaks. Gira whispers Ilya's name, and the brothers smile, unleashing a flaming whirlwind at Gira and Saber. 
The duo are thrown back into the wall, and the windows shatter when they make contact. Saber is about to recover, leaning on his sword to stand when Corsic remarks that they're tired of his obstinate loyalty. With a flick, he sends one of his knives at Corsic, piercing through his aura and stabbing him through the chest. Gira sees this and screams, tearing off his shirt and charging at the two. Outside, Blake and Sun arrive at the back door of the house and are quick to burst into the expansion Blake mentioned back in episode 4. Unbeknownst to them, Ilya is watching them from atop the house and sneaks in through a window that leads to the second floor. When Blake and Sun enter, she openly confronts Blake, prompting Blake to send Sun ahead to help her mom and dad. Sun questions if that's wise, but Blake assures him that she can handle this. He leaves, and we get the last ideological spar before Ilya and Blake come to blows. Blake wonders aloud why Ilya isn't already inside helping out the Albions, to which Ilya says she needed to prepare herself. Despite what it must seem, she genuinely doesn't want to do this. Blake questions why she's even still there, and Ilya lashes back that she doesn't have a choice in the matter. It's the only thing that works. Blake shouts that she's made more allies through kindness than violence, to the point that she considers a schnee of all people one of her closest friends. There are better ways. Ilya refuses to respond, and Blake asks her to stay out of her way before trying to leave. Instead, Ilya drops down and attacks, and we get the original Ilya and Blake fight, though the lights are already off at the beginning. You know, the power was cut. When Ilya goes all stealthy, she'll simply blend in with the floorboards and wall panels, since Blake can see in the dark. But yeah, other than that, this is untouched, dialogue and all. In fact, aside from a few blocking issues, the rest of this fight is pretty good as well, ignoring the direct ripoff of My Hero Academia, of course. The only major change we're throwing in there is some of the combat dialogue where Gira tries to warn Ilya she's being framed. This, of course, will confuse her, as well as Blake and Sun, and lead to Fennec and Corsic deriding her for even listening to our heroes like their words actually mean anything. Blake helps draw the line of how the White Fang will hurt anyone to get what they want, will help push Ilya towards turning her back on Corsic and Fennec. The rest of the scene plays out as normal. Fennec dies, Albion is knocked out by Ilya, and Ilya has a crippling breakdown. Outside the Belladonna Manor, we don't get any grandiose speeches. Instead, we get a quiet scene of reflection, watching as the rescue services begin to swarm the house as well as guards and onlookers. Gira carries out Saber's body and lays it out reverently on the ground, while Blake and Sun lead Ilya, Corsic, and a few surviving White Fang members out in handcuffs, where other members of the guard are there to meet them. Ilya turns to Blake and apologizes, genuinely. She looks at the cuffs at her wrist and groans wryly that she's really screwed herself over. Blake says that it was close, but ultimately there's a lot Ilya can still walk back from. She just needs to give it time and really reflect on what she's done the last few years. Both of them look up at the burning building, and the flames fading into the night round out the episode. Our episode 19 begins like the original episode 10, with John and Ruby arriving in Kuroyuri, wondering aloud if any of the buildings look like they have a pharmacy or clinic in them. They also touch on Ren's refusal to come to town, though it's clear to both of them why he wouldn't without it being said. The flashback with Ren and his mother is basically untouched until Nora comes into the picture, and even then it's just small dialogue tweaks. When the bullies ask where Nora came from, one of the kids mentions she must be one of those Fiskers from the north, helping us slot in a little bit of lore as background detail. They compare her to an abandoned dog with rabies, saying she's absolutely worthless since no one cares about her. And, uh, wow, you know, I did not expect to be putting this much child abuse in this season, but here I am with three instances of kids getting the short end of the stick. I wonder what this says about me as a person. Best maybe not to read too much into that. Ren sees all of this and is too scared to intervene, opting to run off after Nora and the bullies see him. He runs right into Hanzo, and yes, I'm going to keep calling him that because it's easier than saying Ren's dad all the time, and the audio commentary made it at least clear someone on the team knew what they were doing with this design. Anyway, Hanzo scares everyone else off and asks Ren if he too wishes to run. Ren is still too scared to do or say anything, and Hanzo gives him an important life lesson about action versus inaction, and sends Ren home to his mother while he goes to talk to the mayor about some bandit sightings nearby. We come back to Ruby and John in the present, unable to find supplies or even a sturdy building they can hold up inside to wait for help. They hear the knuckle of V in the distance, which sets them on edge, if not for themselves, then for Nora and Ren's safety. With Crow leaning against the courtyard tree, Ruby begins to regret dragging John and the rest into this mess, since they didn't know about, well, the scope of what they were dealing with. John rattles off how much they've lost together. Pira, Penny, their futures and how Ruby has lost even more beyond that and is still pushing forward, looking to bring justice to the people that destroyed Beacon. She didn't drag them along, she gave them the courage to follow. When they were just as lost, she chose a direction when no one else would, and they fell in behind her because it was the only thing that could bring them out of the dark hole the world had made for them. So what if things had gotten more complicated? She made a choice, and so had they. 
Now all that's left to do is see those choices through to the very end. They stare back at each other with smiles as we use the tree silhouette to transition into another flashback with Ren. Ren is woken up by his mother, and Hanzo, yes, his name is Lee, I'm sticking with Hanzo, comes in, telling them they need to flee. His mother suggests the safe house, and instead of suggesting they get a huntsman, Hanzo says the other huntsmen are struggling and it may be better to flee the village. This helps imply, at least to some extent, Hanzo here is in fact a huntsman, which will give him a reason to stay a scene or two from now and help the threat against the Nekalavi. It also nips that little issue of, why don't any of these settlements have huntsmen in the bud once and for all? Anyway, as Ren's mom is reassuring him, the Nuck bursts through the roof and kills her in what is probably one of my favorite scenes in the entire series. Seriously, kudos for that level of diegetic subversion. Caught me off guard during that first watch through three years ago? Oh god, I've been doing this for almost four years. What even is my life? Anyway, when the screen cuts black, Ren is being carried by Hanzo through the streets while people are panicking and being picked off by smaller Grimm. While not the main threat, it at least establishes that more Grimm have shown up in the wake of the Knuckle of e, or at the behest of something else. When Hanzo trips, it's apparent he's too wounded to carry Ren to safety, and begs him to be brave and escape on his own. He hands off his knife, Ren cries, and when the Nuck finally appears, Hanzo screams for him to run and distracts it with his arrows. Ren runs off and hides under a bridge. He sees Nora under one of the houses, accidentally unlocks his semblance while hyperventilating, and goes to comfort her as the Nevermores begin to sweep in for cleanup duty. They hold each other, meet officially, he gives her her tiny hammer, which I only just this watch through realized they set up earlier with the merchant stall, so kudos for the foresight there, and they wait for night to pass, when all the Grimm have dispersed. When the morning sun shines, the two hold hands together and make their way out of town. As they leave through one of the arches, from the foreground of the forest, we see a long burgundy boot stomp down into the mud, obscuring the camera. We use the curved walls of the settlement to transition over to the mountains Ren and Nora are climbing. This is completely untouched, not even small dialogue changes need to be made like I usually have to. They get up the mountain, find Xion's flag, Hanzo's arrows, and what seems to be the Nux lair where it sheds all the weapons that get trapped in it, and they stare out morosely as the Nux stalks through the trees towards Kuroyuri. The camera leaves us on them holding hands in distress, and over the blackness we hear the Nux scream. We open episode 20 staring at the sun before tilting the camera down to see the Zhao Long household, where Yang is finishing up painting her mechanical arm yellow. Nearby, we can see Neo pulling Roman's hat out of the bag, frowning before placing it on her head. She focuses for a minute, and the traditional pink wave returns to her head, as well as her heterochromia. With a relieved breath, she lets the illusion drop, smiling as she returns to looking like Jane Doe. We cut to the shed, where Neptune is actually beside Bumblebee with a wrench as Yang approaches. Neptune compliments Yang on what a fine machine she has. A few months of disuse and she's barely collected dust. Yang accepts the compliment and offers him a mechanical arm, helping him to his feet. He thanks her for letting him toy around with it and says that it should be getting a little bit better mileage, but he doesn't want her to quote him on it. He says he's going to miss having her around, but he guesses it wouldn't have lasted very long anyway. He's got tickets to Argus next week. He even ribs her, saying that when Haven starts back up in the fall and the remains of Season make it down to Mistral to attend, they should link up and get something to eat. Yang agrees, and he walks his way out the door, passing Neo who he still calls Jane in the process. He says farewell to her as well, though much more truncated because they didn't really interact as much, and departs. Neo and Yang approach the bike and look at it together, and this is where Tai gives us the, you know, I never said you were ready, line. Though, tacked on is an either of you statement for Neo. Yang playfully goads him to stop her, and he turns her down, saying he's still sore from the last spar that she's done with him, complimenting how much control she's gotten with that arm. He just wanted to say goodbye without it being a letter like her sister. He finally gets down to business, and he asks what exactly her plan is. Yang says she's chasing after her, leaving it vague as to who she's talking about. Tai says, Well, in that case, I think a map might be handy, holding out a map for Neo to take. Neo takes a hold of it, and he holds it a little bit longer before giving it up. He looks Neo in the eyes, then to Yang, then back to Neo before making them promise to take care of each other. The two share a look and nod. He looks Yang in the eyes and says that he trusts her, he really does, and goes in for a solid hug. He says he'd tell them to be careful, but he knows that's not going to happen. He knocks her robotic arm gently and says to at least come back in one piece this time. She gives him a gentle punch back with a snicker. We cut to see Bumblebee speeding off into the distance, Ty watching them go. He seems happy but frowns, lifting a scroll to look at what seems to be a police file containing grainy images of Neapolitan and her association with Roman Torchwick. Ty sighs and just mumbles, I hope you know what you're doing. 
With Weiss, we get our daring escape with Klein, though we change things up when she passes her father's study. Instead of Klein being called away, the two pass her father's door and she catches an argument between Jock and Ironwood over the border closing. We get all the little details, how Jock claims Winter was stolen by the military, how James is relying on her information to make this decision, the movement of supplies and weapons inside Mistral, Ironwood's trust issues, all that good junk. During this, Y stops to actively listen and waves Klein to go forward just in case she gets caught. Worried, but dutifully, Klein complies and tells her to meet him at the first floor library. When Ironwood declares that it's no one in or out without the round table's permission, Jock corrects that it's without Ironwood's permission. To that, Ironwood begins to leave the room, saying that he'd think that Jock would want to be on his side. Weiss backs off and actually summons a glyph to shut the door, but James is too quick to open it, stepping partway into the hallway. He and Weiss meet eyes, both freezing for a millisecond. He looks from Weiss to the bags to her shocked face and then offers a soft smile tacit approval for whatever defiance she's acting out on. Further, he actually stays in the doorway and turns to Jacques, commenting how unfortunate it must be for Jacques, having all that money and no power to back it up. This throws both of them into a more heated argument, giving him time to wave Weiss away behind his back. She gets the hint, sneaking down the rest of the hallway. In the library, Klein pops out of the hidden passage and invites her in. They hug, he asks if Mistral is safe, she confirms it's where she'll find her sister, yada yada yada. They share a moment before Klein is called for by Jacques, and Klein urges Weiss through the passage. They say a last goodbye, and Weiss passes on one last thank you to him before he shuts the door. We transition to Menagerie, where a jail door has just been closed as Blake visits Ilya in lockup. Korsik is ranting and raving at Ilya that she's a traitor from a different cell. Ilya appears pensive over the whole ordeal and grips the bars tightly. She apologizes for trying to hurt Blake and her family. She's very uncomfortable to admit that Blake may have a point. The White Fang is losing sight of what it was doing if its members are so willing to turn on each other. She feels a touch of shame it took her a personal betrayal to feel it click for her. She likes to think she's more self-aware than that. Blake says she wasn't completely wrong. The White Fang are wrong, but Blake admits that she did run from the Fang, from Vale, from her friends. It didn't make sense, but she worked it through with her friends and family and she's ready to face everything that scared her. And with a little effort, Ilya can overcome her problems too especially with a friend at her side. Ilya goes cross, saying very firmly the White Fang aren't wrong. What's happening now? That's not the White Fang she signed up for, but she's still signed on to fight for the Faunus against the humans. If the fear tactics were working, she'd keep using them, because evidently things like peace talks don't get results. Blake sighs, lamenting being on the other side of the argument, that she just wishes that Ilya could see what she has, that even someone as obstinate as Weiss Schnee could have her eyes opened and become a friend. Ilya rests her head against the bars and muses that Blake was always surprisingly optimistic as a person. Blake shakes her head and tries to explain that, while it was peaceful, what it took to open people's eyes wasn't just sitting down and talking. There was yelling, there was fighting. They struggled to understand each other, and in the end not everyone agreed, but enough did, and Blake felt safe. And she wants that for Ilya too, because despite everything, she still considers Ilya a friend, just one that needs a wake-up call. Ilya smiles, but it soon droops. She closes her eyes and presses her forehead deeper into the bars, lamenting that Blake doesn't see her the same way. Blake says Ilya was a trusted friend, and she'd like Ilya to be a trusted friend again. But no, she can't reciprocate. She's not really in a position to be in a relationship with anyone, and besides there's... Blake trails off, conflicted on what to say. Ilya immediately assumes, is there someone else? She pauses and goes a little flat, is it Sun? Blake refutes that, Sun's dear to her, but any romantic attraction she felt towards him was fleeting. But she does trust him, and she hopes that she can trust Ilya the same way by the end of things. She reaches out for Ilya to hold her hand. Ilya hesitates before taking it, and the two share a nice quiet moment together, before Corsic's reinvigorated ranting interrupts them. Ilya turns more serious and tells Blake there's more. She was only the first messenger to deliver a video recording from Adam. She tells Blake to search the Menagerie White Fang headquarters. She knows Adam has a plan, but she has no idea what it is, and it most certainly isn't good for anyone. Blake thanks her and says goodbye, promising to stop by again soon. She walks out of the room, and a tracking shot transitions us from walking out of the lockup to Nora and Ren running into Kuroyuri. The two find John, Ruby, and Crow just as Ren has started falling into a small mental breakdown. As Ruby and John express confusion, Ren falls into a depressive spiral, muttering, no, 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 
over and over and over again. When Ruby asks what the issue is, Nora lifts her finger and points to a creature rounding out from behind a distant building. We get scattered images of different parts of the Nuck before finding its screaming, melty mouth, ending the episode. Okay, folks, say it with me now. Episodes 21 and 22 are combined into one big episode. I'm pretty sure at this point, it's so regular people can recite it in their heads. Crap, am I becoming predictable? Quick, bring in the clowns! Okay, but on a more serious note, we open with the Nuck attack on Kuroyuri, where Ranger are being thrown back after what we can assume is an initial assault by it. We get the nice long reveal shot for this absolutely grotesque design before we start the hop back into things. For a second, we actually get to see what Vision is like for a Grim as we see through the Nuck's eyes. Everything is in white scale, with outlines that occasionally blur together making it difficult to see things unless the Grim's head is moving or the object is moving itself. The exceptions are the people, who are very clearly surrounded in a miasma of black mist that outlines them clearly to the creature's vision. It scans over the group before settling in on the biggest cloud of darkness. Crow. Seeing it look towards her uncle, Ruby is the one that speeds forward to push him out of the way as the Nuck lashes forward with a noodle arm and punches right through the tree where Crow was resting. Not used to carrying the weight of a full-grown man, Ruby stumbles at the end of her dash and has to readjust, giving the Nuck time to charge. Ren drops to the ground and we see a semblance spread out, grayscaling the ground, Ruby, and Crow. From the Nuck's point of view, we see the miasma dissipate completely. It stops, confused, just as a salvo of grenades from Nora slam into its side. It runs off, and Ruby continues speeding Crow off to safety. When she drops him off at an abandoned house, he grabs her arm only to pass out before saying anything. Ruby rushes back to the fight, where Nora, Ren, and John are circling the Nuck. When Ruby rushes right for it, she's knocked out of the sky, which prompts John to yell at her to circle straight. The four continue circling it, taking swipes and pot shots at it while it's unable to lock onto any of them. It's during this that some of Nora's grenades miss and slam into the side of two or three buildings, one of which is housing a small buildup of bird nests. Sparks from the grenade ignite the nest, and over the course of the fight we see the building ignite and spread. This will not affect the fight beyond adding a touch of dramatic lighting, but it will come into play later. With all this running around, the Nuck does the old bring it around town and knocks all of them off their feet. It rips its mouth open and extends the spikes in its back, becoming, well, mostly more intimidating. And before you ask, no, John is not getting his big sword mode. It's stupid. This upgrade is stupid. Possibly the dumbest in the whole show. And that's saying something when the main character mains a freaking gardening implement. Speaking of John, the Nuck actually trots over to where he's fallen and slams down at him with its front hooves. He blocks it with his shield, but between his struggling and the crater it's slowly carving with his body, he's only got a few seconds before being crushed. Nora and Ren watch from their prone positions, though Nora seems to have a plan. With a determined look on her face, she reaches into her pocket and pulls out a crystal of dust. Ren sees this and yells for her to stop, just as she stabs it into her shoulder in a flurry of electric sparks. She bursts forward to slam into the Nuck, taking it off balance enough for John to escape and for Ruby to get another strike in, enraging it further. Nora collapses to the side, clearly in pain, and her body twitches from the dust inside of her. Considering we've seen her hit with electricity up to this point, we can ascertain injecting dust right into her body may be more potent but also more painful and dangerous. Back with the Nuck, it turns towards Ruby only to see a larger black cloud a couple of blocks away, which we should be able to guess is Crow. A quick cutaway to him shivering and groaning from the position will confirm this for us, so when we jump back to the Nuck, we can see it's losing interest in Ranger over the misery it can see elsewhere. Picking up on this, Ren climbs the tree in the courtyard and fires at it, distracting it. It pins him to the wall, and it's about to finish him off with its other hand when Nora, in her weakened state, calls for Ruby to launch her. She launches, blocks the blow with her hammer, her and Ren get a cute moment together, and Nora becomes less like Thor and more like Loki when the Nuck slams her back and forth. And for all those of you wondering, the reason why the Nuck pauses while Ren and Nora have their moment is that it's still debating whether to kill them or go for that tasty Kentucky Fried Crow just around the corner instead, and its indecisive head movements will give that away. Anyway, being tossed like a ragdoll finally breaks Nora's aura and she's left seemingly comatose. Ren breaks free but ultimately gets his teeth kicked in, loses his pistols, and his aura broken. When the Nuck charges at them and Nora sees Ren is about to charge it right back, unarmed, she tackles him under a building while John and Ruby distract the Nuck. Nora literally and figuratively slaps some sense into the incensed Ren, explaining that they can do this, but they can't just be reckless about it. When she says that, she spasms a little, 
and after Pain of the Dust, at least we can figure that from the way she holds her arm. She says she won't let him kill himself like this, that after everything they've been through, she won't let it end. He pulls out his father's blade, and she wraps his fingers around the hilt. They nod to each other and crawl out from under the building. The rest of the fight plays out like in the canon show, with some good team work to immobilize its arms and body, then Ren finishing it off with his melodramatic little speech. A little corny, but it conveys what it needs to and allows Ren to digest what he needs to. And while that might feel a little underwhelming for what is essentially the creature that murdered his parents, well, with the changes we've made, he's not really gone after the one that's really responsible. Now has he? Ren collapses, Nora hugs him, Ruby runs off to tend the crow and has a nice moment where he congratulates them on killing the Nuck. This is when the airship arrives, having seen the smoke from the buildings that caught fire all the way over in Sakura So. They get picked up, and a throwaway line from John asks them to take them straight to Mistral, as Crow gets his wounds tended to by one of the medics. Ruby gets to tell Crow they made it, Nora and Ren have their quiet moment together to hold hands, and we get our first look at Mistral and Haven as we pull up to them on the horizon. We cut to the house where Ranger is set up, with Crow resting and Ruby begins writing her letter to Yang, which is unchanged from the original because, well, like Pyrrha's speech about criminal fights in V3, everything applies. While Ruby speaks, we get the shot of Weiss paying off Pilot Boy to take her to Mistral, which is untouched. At the Belladonna house, we get Blake opening a chest with the Albion name emblazoned on it, and she pulls out the tattered White Fang flag. We cut to Yang and Neo aboard a boat, leaning against a wall and being all cool and stuff. Yang's looking at the Team Stark picture while Neo studies the map. At Beacon, we find it's been mostly secured, with all but the tower being fretted over by rescue workers. The tower itself has been sectioned off, and as the black ichor drops from the weavern, whatever emerges is quickly gunned down by Coco and a small cadre of other huntsmen, who are languidly sitting around the barricade. Behind her, Velvet looks down at her scroll, where she and Coffee have been accepted into Shade Academy. With Nora, Ren, and John, the three sit together in one of the Mistral House's rooms, alone, quietly decompressing with each other. We go back to Weiss on the airship, looking out a window in a mirror to her exit in Season 3. Then we jump back to Blake, who is watching a micro-hologram of Adam's speech. Sighing at it, she turns it off and looks to Sun, smiling a bit to see him there. With Yang and Neo, they arrive at Himawari's docks, driving up past the train station being repaired. We hop back to Velvet and Cardin as they meet at the docks and say goodbyes to each other. Cardin says that he's found a job in Mistral for him and his team, so they'll be heading there. They wish each other luck and promise to stay in touch, then share a tender hug before pulling away. There's some lingering there, but as much as I'd love to push the Holy Bun ship, turning Cardin into a good kid and one of Coffee's friends is already a pretty sharp deviation from canon as is. From there we visit Adam, settling into his throne in new cool digs as designed by the sketchy huntsman, not that scrub uniform he's worn from volume 4 onward. Ruby finishes penning her letter and sets it down before going over to her uncle who comments that he guesses that she was the one that saved him this time around. Ruby rounds out her monologue to Yang as Yang and Neo hit the fork in the road where the sign has been scrawled out to say bandits, and Neo appraises the map. They share a look, a smile, and a nod, and the two take off into the middle distance. With Ruby's last words about things finally going their way, we get a pan over of Leo Leinhardt's office, and we get our first ever shot of Watts in this entire series, with his mention of Salem being our first and only indicator that this meeting with Leo should be concerning. The rising strings cut us to black, and we hit the credits. With the credits over, we get an after credits scene with Crow nursing a drink in a Mistralian bar. A shadowed figure approaches behind him and he turns to meet them. His eyes narrow and immediately his hand is on Harbinger, drawing it out and pressing it to the man's throat. We get a close-up shot of a sinister smile and the man says, Well, now that's a welcome. I'm supposed to ask you for my cane. Crow squints at the man, and then draws back, stashing Harbinger and pulling out Osman's cane. He tosses it to the man, commenting, It's good to see you, Oz, but you got a sick sense of humor. The man catches it, saying, Oh, you don't know the half of it. The shadows peel back, revealing the very much alive Roman Torchwick. New outfit and all. Cut to black, volume done. <laughs> I'd genuinely like to know how many people saw that one coming. I've had that in the works for three goddamned years, and I've only spoken a peep about it to like five people. Do you know how long I've kept that in my back pocket? 
I needed to make sure that Ruby did nothing of substance with Oscar before deciding to make the switch, and Volume 7 confirmed it for me that Oscar was just an excuse to have a blank slate fill Ospin's shoes. Replacing his scenes with moments from Roman's past felt like a fitting change, and one that not only foreshadowed his return, but also his character development going forward. It really surprised me that not enough people noted how succinct my summary of Roman was at the end of Volume 3. Kind of skimmed over him just because I wanted this entire moment to come. So yes, welcome back Roman Torchwick to the cast. An interesting element that's going to no doubt be a blast to play with and an utter pain as well. Same goes for Neo, who is now Yang's journey buddy, because everybody gets one, except Weiss. All she's really getting is Pilot Boy, but that's all she really needs, am I right? Actually, concerning Weiss and Team Ranger, I've not really changed much of anything regarding them this volume. I've simply spaced out their stories a little bit more, modified a few key moments so characters can breathe, and offered a little more explanation for the actions they took, as well as set up a major plot point in the next volume, though I wonder if anyone can guess what that is. And no, it doesn't involve Roman. Yang was a tougher nut to crack, since the canon volume already handled her surprisingly well. It was a rare instance where I was hesitant to change things because of their already present quality, but needed to in order to fill the proper time slot. So why not throw Neo into the mix, explain her own survival from the events of Volume 3, and give her more to work with herself as a character while using her as a foil to Yang? Well, maybe Kana Neo isn't quite as soft as I've made her out to be here, we don't actually know all that much about her other than her combat prowess and the fact she's almost literally a tool for whoever's in charge. So, in that way, I felt justified in the modification. Blake was easily the hardest character to get right, and as you can tell, I've basically delivered myself a clean slate for Volume 5 now that I've compacted the bulk sum of it into Blake's plot in Volume 4. Ilya, meanwhile, in this volume, serves as both an extension of and foil to Adam. Someone who's walking down almost the same road, but hasn't quite crossed the point of no return. Someone who has a chance to redeem herself in the eyes of the audience and the world. Blake, meanwhile, gets a more conflicted character arc, wherein she wrestles with her own reasons for leaving and what exactly she wants to do, and Sun serves as that little bit of light to help guide her towards an answer. Not his answers, mind you, but her own. And while I didn't have Blake arriving at her own answer quite yet, it's clear that she's decided that she needs to do something. Because being part of the Guard isn't all she can be doing for the world when Adam is leading a coup in the White Fang. Speaking of Adam, he got his own little character arc this time around, a replacement for that honestly pointless villain cutaway we had in Volume 4. Those accomplished nothing other than to shove Cortana in our faces and prove that Cinder is best when she doesn't open her mouth. But yes, Adam and Sienna are given more screen time to develop the internal politics of the White Fang and the differences in ideology that led to Adam assassinating her. What we see here, and at the beginning of Volume 5, is going to be Adam at his apex, at his most threatening, and I'm excited to see how the hill begins to tip down the farther he goes. Special thanks to Romulus Numa and Spring Dragonfly for contributing to the adding flavor to Remnant spreadsheet, allowing me to pull out Tonfuism and Faunalist superiority out for pseudo-religious nods. Yes, I do use that sheet from time to time. It's rare, but it comes in handy when I really need that extra oomph. Consider adding to it yourself. Moderately Entertained Zero has kept it up and running, and he did such a good job of setting it up. It's always a lot of fun to see how other people interpret the setting and how they want to add to it. For example, I preach to you my new religion the followers of the fluffy ears, and I encourage you all to join, or else I disown you. And that, my friends, is Volume 4. I still feel to some degree Volumes 2 and 3 are the apexes of my work on the series thus far, but Volume 4 only needed some retooling as opposed to complete overhauls, so I guess that's to be expected. I wasn't doing much of the heavy lifting here, except for the timeline. Holy shit, that goddamn timeline. Official dates, or at least approximate time zones, guys. It comes in so goddamn handy. If you feel like there's something that I've missed, there's something you don't feel works, or you just want to show general support, please let me know in the comments below. The most pressing questions and issues raised will be addressed in the follow-up streams about a week or two after I finish uploading the series, so I hope to see you all there. Of course, this project would be nowhere near as awesome without the tireless work of the sketchy Huntsman. Last year, we had only around 12 artists that did a total of 19 images. This year, we had somewhere around 30 artists who did somewhere in the vicinity of 180 images. Holy crap! It's because of their hard work and effort this project came out so spectacularly, and I hope that the team can keep growing and growing as the series goes on. There are some big ideas being thrown around about Volume 5, and I am excited to see how many of them we can pull off. 
Now, keep in mind, I couldn't do this all without my lovely patrons, each of which have supported me through thick and thin. Remember that for one dollar or more to my Patreon, you get access to the Team Frostbite Discord server where Fat Man Folly, Dashie Lee, and myself are regular participants, as well as other fan favorites like Mediocrity, the Floof Artist, and the rare but enjoyable British Ninja. Otherwise, if you want to support the channel but don't want to pay a dime, you can subscribe, click that bell, and make sure you have notifications active. This will let you see all of my content when it pops up on the channel. If you're still not receiving updates, because honestly, YouTube's algorithm has only gotten worse these days, feel free to follow me on Twitter, at Raymond underscore McNeil, where I regularly update about what's come out most recently, and what I'm working on next. Thank you all so much for watching, I hope to see you all in my next video. Until then, catch you all on the flip side.